too much of a practical a practical head on my shoulders. I'd, um, I, I'd, I've had this conversation like many, many, many times before about my... I've, I've got a very kind of matter-of-fact approach to everything, and as a result, it makes me at times very rigid to to understand other people's not positions I, you know I, i've got enough kind of empathy that way that i can understand where people are coming from i just don't always or most of the time don't understand why people can be stuck in certain ruts when like in my brain there's a there's a way out of it um and that's a flaw that's a flaw in my design like things like addiction um I, you know, I can't quite quantify that in, in my head, even though myself, I have a, like a specific personality that I'm a, you know, give everything, give, give something all or, or don't bother trying kind of approach, which once again backfires on me horribly. It means I can spend a lot of time doing, uh, it's like when I trained for, a, I, I decided I wanted to do a marathon. I gave myself very little time to do it um, and I about killed myself preparing to do it, but I did it. Um, and as soon as I did it, had no inkling at all to want to continue to train for a marathon. That was me. I'd done it. So, you know, on to the next thing, um, which <laughs> like, now I don't know if that's necessarily healthy. I think the healthy thing to do is take your time and grow an appreciation and love for it, uh, which I didn't do. So I think podcasting's maybe the only thing where I set myself a challenge and have continued doing it beyond the challenge, but it took me years to get to where I wanted to get to. So had I achieved the the kind of download numbers that I wanted when I first started, like within the first year, I don't know if I'd still be podcasting. I think I probably would have given up, but the fact it took me like, what, six, six years to get there. I was like that at the end of six years, like, you know, I actually quite enjoy this. <laughs> I'm glad I've spent six years doing it. So- So you feel like, it, like the need, the if you had gotten success too quickly, like the need to achieve success, having the goal yeah. was more ultimately more of a, 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 a like a, a motivation. Yeah. It's like a bucket like list if, thing. If you'd gotten it too quickly, you, you, you could have walked away because it was too easy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's basically, I mean, that's a very concise way, way to put that, but I think there's, there's, I, I've always kind of been of the, the approach that, you know, try and maximize the time to do the things that you want to do, um, but get everything you can out of those things and move on to the next thing, which, you know, because like the, the more time you spend doing one thing is time you are removing doing something else. So, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know, which is like what I see, I, I don't have the most, uh, I'm not the most sympathetic here when, when like I, from my perspective, I can see a way out of something that people can't, you know, I give that advice. If they don't take it, then at that point, you've, you've done all you can. And yeah, kinda, pretty and much. I'm, yeah. And it's, it's not a good thing. <laughs> it's, I, I've been called at times very cold that way. And I think it's accurate. I am quite cold that way, but like, if you want to try the thing I suggested, you have my, you know, I will give you all the support and effort and time to to help you succeed in that but if you dismiss it straight away then you've made your bed and they're fucking lying it so um yeah I, I don't know what that says about me bo ransdom uh, out with the fact that i'm cold callous and potentially scottish uh <laughs> welcome folks to the oh, ice queen's lair son of a bitch it's it's duncan Evo, come correct uh, this time around it's duncan Evo slash fiction our continuing journey through the continually confusing uh <laughs> well this episode this one takes the biscuit ball this one <laughs> oh no <laughs> oh boy this frost the muffin duncan <laughs> that's an old callback um <laughs> folks thanks uh thanks for joining us if it's uh morning or afternoon for you uh thanks for joining us live um mm -hmm. i would say i was kind of late and remiss in asking for uh ask duncan and bo questions which often features in the in the center of this program, Duncan. Mm -hmm. I know you don't watch it, but in the uh, in the middle of the show, sometimes um, we'll we'll answer some questions. And uh, I I haven't gotten any questions yet, but if you throw them into chat, uh, if there are questions uh, worthy, I take that back. No, we did get questions. I'm a no. I'm a I'm a damn liar, Duncan. You are I've, a bad I've, man. I've, I've lied. <laughs> I have lied to you. 
<laughs> I have lied to our audience. And I've um, lied before Jesus. So we do have a couple of questions, but if you want to throw some into the chat, then change the point, Duncan. Then change the original uh, premise here, which is that if you wanted uh, perhaps to throw some questions into chat, uh, yeah. I'll keep an eye out and uh, and we'll, we'll include those. Um, Participation is not mandatory, but no, it is appreciated. No, 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 no. If you if you want to chat, please do. If you don't, that's fine. Sometimes it's kind of like donations sometimes at the church, Bo, isn't it? You know, they're not mandatory, but they are appreciated. Yes, that's right. Uh, although, you know, in some cases, tips are mandatory, you know? <laughs> <laughs> like uh that that doorman that won't like leave like uh after you, he brings up the luggage and they, yep. they don't leave until they get the tip like in the movies duncan mm -hmm. you know when they stand there with their palm out and you're like i i don't i don't keep cash on me anymore because who does it's do 2021 you, right do you have a, like a square box or something can i slide <laughs> yeah. a card also is your industry even doing anything right now <laughs> Right. Also, why am I in this hotel risking everyone's lives? Yeah. <laughs> Have you been vaccinated? Have I been vaccinated? <laughs> what year is it? <laughs> yeah. So we we like to begin the show with uh, not just Lynchian references, but it's that's kind of a tradition too. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I'm here to stay. <laughs> um, but we also are not what they seem more. They're not what they seem at all. <laughs> yeah. Uh... It's a real mess out there today. That's his his weather reports. God bless that man. He's still doing them. I, I love the fact that yeah. he teased an announcement and everyone thought it was going to be about the show that he's about to do for Netflix. Yeah. And it was just but it was just literally that he was going to continue doing his weather reports. Um and I was like, that's probably the most lynching thing that's happened this year. Well, it's like everyone anticipating them to do something and him completely subverting that expectation is the most lynch thing you can do. I, I saw somebody on Twitter saying, and I, I thought this was the best summary of it, is this announcement could be about his weather thing on YouTube. Mm -hmm. It could be about the Netflix show. It could be something about Twin Peaks. It could be a totally separate puppet movie. It could be anything. And that's the beauty of David Lynch saying, I've got a big announcement. Yeah, it can like... be anything. It could yeah, like... be, I've discovered Argyle. <laughs> it is like, <laughs> paisley pattern is my style this year um what's hot plaid what's not but, time I, but i think i think you're right like to me a surprise announcement should be a surprise um and most of the time we can predict it you know, from, from right. given the source and like as well, most of the time it's leaked to the press in advance, but Lynch still has that ability to to, to keep you on your toes. Uh, and I, I kind of love that. Kind of love that. And yes, and that's why he will always be adored on DBCC. That's yes. He is practically a mascot at this point. Um, <laughs> Patron seat. Kind, yeah, maybe that's more <laughs> St. <Saint> David. <laughs> I'm an atheist. Nope, nope. I'm afraid. That honestly, <laughs> uh, I you know I've been talking about starting a, a cult for some time, as you well know. You have been, yeah. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> and I think I'm gonna base it. I may have already told you about this. I'm gonna base it entirely around Twin Peaks because the mythology is kind of already there, but you can interpret it a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the, the way I'm gonna interpret it is gonna make me a wealthy man, Duncan. I can't wait because communion at that church involves cherry pie and coffee. So you have me in, sir. There's a lot of solo dancing to <laughs> just instrumentals that are a lot of like xylophone and standing bass. <laughs> Our, yeah, it's going to be good. Um, but what a, uh, in addition to answering questions sometimes, uh, before we get to the middle of the show, Duncan, we got to, mm -hmm. we got to do the beginning. And at the beginning of the show, what we do is we talk about what we've been watching recently, one good, one bad. Um, because we like balance, you know, moderation and all things. Yin yang, yes. That's right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Sunrise and the sunset. And <laughs> <laughs> so, Duncan, do you have a preference? Do you do you want to go? Uh, yeah, I, I, I've got a good and a bad. So, oh. and I, I, yeah, I, I, You're I mean, prepared? The thing, yeah. I, but the thing, the, I've not had a lot of 
to be honest with you, most of my viewing this year has not been on the bad side, mostly because I'm playing catch up on a lot of things. So I'm purposely watching things that have been recommended to me, um, which is, you know, it's a great way to be. Um, however, we will start with the bad. And it's not terrible. It's just, it's one of those movies where I think had I saw it at the time, I would have a fondness for it. And it probably doesn't help that people keep referring to, and I, once again, I know why they make the comparison, um, but the movie is going to be covered on podcast under the stairs tomorrow. It's Student Bodies, which is part of the slasher classic That's collection. the Brad Pitt movie, right? Yeah, yeah. Isn't he kinda, yeah. hopping around in that thing for a little bit? Yeah, until like blinking, you miss him. Uh, it's... I'd, how to describe it? It's like the, all the the blurb now puts it through the lens of well, this is a meta slasher horror comedy. So think Scream, which is that I, I mean, Scream's the easy one to throw out because it's obviously the big movie. But I think people forget that meta existed before Scream. <laughs> Re- Return of the Killer Tomatoes, kind of a meta movie. Yeah, there there are lots of them. <laughs> In fact, they date back almost as as old as mo- you know, cinema itself. There, you know, as soon as you had people doing some sort of movie, as soon as you could put a, a spin that took into account things that existed within the former medium, you're kind of doing something meta, which is kind of what this does. I mean, it's it's fine. I mean, the jokes are maybe funny at the time i don't know they didn't really make me laugh all that much and the movie passed by uh you know a reasonable pace but i don't particularly think it's well acted i don't think it's particularly well written um even for movies of the time this is 83 so even for movies at the time i'm, I'm just and yeah the more i watched it the more i felt like I feel that I've been cheated the experience of being younger watching this movie. Like, had I saw this about the same time as I was discovering movies like Friday the 13th, yeah, I, I would probably gravitate more towards it. But coming at it at the tender age of 39 now, you know, <laughs> sitting watching it, it, it has a lot of obstacles to overcome to endear itself to me. And the movie just doesn't do that. So... And I'm sure there are people out there that are fucking mortified by that because they hold it near and dear to their heart. But I just found it a bit bland, uh, if I'm honest. And yeah. I haven't seen and it people need to, yeah. Well, people need to stop doing the... I, I'm terrible for... I, I think you should only ever use movies for comparison purposes as either look at is directly copying from or for for context as in well you know these movies came out about the same time so there's a clear trend towards or away from um and yeah i think scream is just a very easy movie to throw um in the conversation when dealing with anything meta related um and that's where the like uh, yeah it's a slasher but it's not a slasher like scream is a slasher it's nowhere near as gory or violent um, in, or in, vicious. As I recall, you know I mean? a bit goofier as well. And, it's far, and, it's, yeah. It is a comedy. You know, yeah. It is specifically designed to... The, the meta aspects in this are to poke loving fun at the genre, but through the medium of humour. Whereas, like, Scream, it's to, you know, it's, it's poking loving fun at horror fans whilst at the same time giving you what you need from a slasher movie, which is, you know, a, a, a you know, mass killer and violence. So it, it should, it, I mean, it shouldn't really be in the same conversation. I know why they do it. And I think, it, like I say, had I seen it way back, I would be more inclined to think it is maybe a better movie than I am giving it credit for. But my, like, I'm just, just like I say, had, and it's in a collection that, it, you know, has to do a lot to make me love the movies in it. Uh, that collection is just hard fucking work. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I'm working my way through it, and uh, that was a, which is a shame because a couple of weeks ago, Popcorn was the movie that was in the collection uh, to do, and Popcorn is a damn fine movie. Not a great movie by any stretch of the imagination, but does exactly what you want. Um, you know, as it, it wears its influences on its sleeve, as gnarly and as you know great creature design and all the rest um and this one it just kind of felt like yeah we could we could do this with any budget with named actors without named actors the gags are kind of lazy and 
That was just my thoughts on that, Bo. How about yourself? Do you have a you have a bad movie in mind? Um, I yes, I do. And I'm kinda like you. This isn't like a rotten movie by any stretch. Um it, it's a, a movie called Future Shock. Uh, is a documentary about the comic 2000 AD. Yeah, so Arrow put this out. This is about Judge Dredd, isn't it? Well, it's Judge Dredd was in the 2080 yeah. comics, and it is uh, about that. It is about the creators and that came out of that, like Alan Moore, and mm -hmm. you know, like the people who would go on to sort of change the comics industry. Sort of came up through the offices of 2000 AD. Ah, and, nice. And yeah, and so it's a really it's it's a subject that is kind of near and dear to my heart because not only do I like comics, I I particularly like kind of alternative comics. And 2000 AD, the the story of that comic is really fascinating. It was really kind of underground, and it was really punk and anti authoritarian, and had a very political kind of message. Um, and it was, uh, like, uh, influential in a number of ways, not just mm -hmm. for being sort of artistically of note, but also for being so brazenly political in a way that, you know, Marvel and DC and superhero comics and shit like that really weren't. And, like, Alan Moore would go on to do Watchmen, which is a crazily political comic. Yeah, oh yeah. But, you know, uh, but it was sort of like them talking about um uh, uh some of these guys being uh you know lifted by dc and and you know at the height of their career a lot of the people who had sort of made 2000 ad uh went off to do all this incredible groundbreaking stuff for dc's vertigo uh shingle and but also it was sort of like yeah but also you know the editors of 2000 ad were kind of dicks and and <laughs> you know so it's it's a it's a good documentary. The my biggest problem with it as a documentary is that if you're not kind of naturally interested in the material, mm -hmm. then I think it's a little arm's length in its approach. Oh, that right, you yeah. kind of I think you have to kind of know a little something about 2000 AD going into it and also sort of like have a, a better familiarity with like here's who alan moore is this is yeah. why it was significant that he was there at the time and and they do some of that but i think it's more a niche documentary as opposed to something that you could just hand to anybody i think the story is good enough that it could it could absolutely engage any viewer but mm -hmm. i think that the presentation of the material isn't necessarily built to kind of entertain you into the the more nuts and bolts parts of the story yeah, yeah. If that makes sense like you yeah. know good documentaries are sort of entertaining first or they're emotionally engaging or something like that whereas yeah, this they is should, they should on some level be able to still hold their own if you have not even a passing interest in the subject matter there should be a hook somewhere to get you you into like if I if I watch a documentary, I I watch documentaries and everything from like war through even sports events, and I am not into sports at all. But if there's an interesting angle or a hook, then I should want to follow that story through, even if I'm not like I, I, I'm, even if I don't know all the key players or specifically the outcome. So if it, you know if it isn't necessarily breaking down the barriers beyond that, you are instantly limiting your audience. And on some level, needlessly, because some of those names that you mentioned, Alan Moore in particular, are, sure. you know, they, their fingers are all over pop culture. So you don't need to be in the comics to, I mean, I was aware of Alan Moore before I was, before I even was aware of what, he, what he'd done, like through From Hell. That was the first time I'd ever come across him. The right. adaptation of, of that, you know, because Johnny Depp was going to be in a movie about Jack the Ripper. And then you do, all right, this guy's done more stuff. What's he done? And then you find it that, it, you know, he very famously hates <laughs> every every adaptation of his work. Um, he, is, he is a quality crotchety old man. Yeah, I love it. He's yeah. got a beard and hair to match. Man, um, if you've never read it, I would highly recommend uh, try to get your hands on a copy of the Alan Moore run on Swamp Thing. Oh, right. He did such a great run on that. Uh, it's like 20-something issues. 
Chad will probably correct me pretty quickly uh, if I've got that wrong. <laughs> but it, it's an amazing run. It's really epic in size, and it's really tragic and heartbreaking. And it also is kind of a 50 sci-fi monster movie. And hmm. it's really fucking good, man. Like, unsurprisingly. Hey, the guy who wrote Watchmen turns out he can make good comic books. Well, yeah, and- but you don't, I, think that, I think that's the point. Like, once you get those names involved, you don't necessarily need to... You don't necessarily need to have a like a, a full vested interest in the subject matter, just the names themselves. And if the if the documentary is maybe not that great at doing that, um, then like I say, you're maybe needlessly. I, I own it, have never watched it, so I got a screener of it ages ago, and it's still in its cellophane. So it's interesting. Uh, again, I had a great time watching it, but the whole time I was like, man. I wish I could recommend this to a friend of mine mm-hmm. who doesn't really give a shit about comic books or anything, but I think the story is good, uh, but I also don't know that it would land with him because it's like, everybody knows who Dave Gibbons is, right? Like, we don't have to go yeah. out of our way to explain <laughs> that, right, everybody? And it's like, well, I mean, I don't. I think you kind of do. You have to explain yeah. <laughs> how significant his art was and, and that kind of thing, but... Um, Anyway, uh, that's my bad, though, and it was still pretty good. I Like, I enjoyed my time with it. So mm-hmm. uh, what, is, what is your good, Duncan? What was the thing that got you all charged up, made you squirm? Yeah, so the, 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 the good for me, um, and it, it does me, like, a, a great sense of relief and a bit of pride uh, to say that the, the, the good this week is uh, a movie called The Stylist. I uh, got a chance to see an advanced copy of it ahead of its release on the Arrow channel. So Arrow Video have just launched a channel in the States and in the UK. It's their version of like a shudder, essentially for Arrow titles and other titles that they'll be licensing out. Um, And as a result, they're putting content that, you know, has a future physical release planned out early on their channel as a way to get you interested in, in checking that stuff out. Um, the stylist is directed by a director who goes under the moniker Jill Six, which I'm going to double down on because her surname is nigh on incomprehensibly difficult for me to pronounce. Um, just because there's a lot of letters in it, and, and I had to apologize to her. Uh, but I know her from way back in the day, I, I got a chance to sit and interview her back in t- late 2014, early 2015 when she just done her first short movie and uh, she, I, I was doing stuff on the Midnight Horror Show at the time. She swung by on that. We got a chance to speak to her. Um, I like, had built up this community. She did like horror, she had like this many horror festival things. So she, she put them on herself. She'd get her friends around, people in the community, get them interested in horror and which led her to make her first short horror movie. She then made a second one, both of which toured called the, the stylist and now she's obviously done the feature length which is taking years but back then she was like i'm gonna have a feature length movie i'm gonna make a feature length horror movie and to now see her achieve that dream and to see arrow pick it up for distribution is kind of fucking cool but there's yeah. always that thing in the back of your head where you're like all right <laughs> i like this person but and this isn't very good uh, i don't know what i'm gonna do um plus it's based on a short the short's like five minutes long and this movie's an hour and 44 minutes long and like in the back of my head i'm like oh right how are you gonna yeah, do this my math that's like three times as long yeah <laughs> mathematicians are what we are um but it, it's really good it's really 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 good uh very assured direction it's kind of I've, I've seen the compa- the obvious comparison is to to something like maniac um i get why that comparison is there and that our antagonist in this movie is a hairstylist who essentially removes the scalp and hair um from from her victims uh, and takes away to put on mannequin heads so i can see where the comparison is Seems there. a pretty straight comparison. I get it. Yeah, but it misses a lot of the complexity of the character that's doing it, which is mostly, once again, it, it's not in the realms of the kind of sexual sadist positional maniac. Like, you know, in, in maniac, it's, it's on some level, it's the torture and abuse of women for sexual gratification. Um, 
in the case of this one, it's more just social awkwardness, you know, the, the inability to feel comfortable in your own skin and or feel comfortable around people uh, and want to make that human connection that you just can't do. Um, so I, I think it, it shares more in the DNA of a movie like me than it does necessarily in a movie like Maniac. Um, really great cast. It's got Bria Grant, who is like oh, literally sure. killing everything she's doing just now. She's fucking brilliant yeah, in yeah, everything. Yeah. Um, she's uh, the, the kind of she's in the co lead. She uh, position. directed She Dies Tomorrow, or was that Amy Siemens who did it's Amy, Amy Siemens that did that? She did 12 Hour Shift. 12 Hour Shift is what I'm thinking of. Yeah, yeah, uh, with um, the check from me, so Angela Bassett, because that's the circle of life. Uh, like so the uh, sorry um no it's it, I, it's come to i've come to expect it yep the, the main the main woman whose name is escaping me at the moment is fucking brilliant in this movie and yeah it's it is it's an hour and 44 long but it doesn't feel that length it, it, and what i love about it is i had a really strong impression of what i thought the ending was going to be and then part of me was like that don't blink you know what i mean like see this through don't you know get give me that ending this is the ending i feel as an audience member i want and the movie did it and um i really 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 enjoyed that so yeah i i, I got a chance to interview her um she's suitably pumped and everyone should should check this movie when it comes out uh she is an interesting talent it'll be interesting to see well that the, once again this is her first feature and it has a, a huge degree of confidence about it that I am excited for, because uh, we have a whole. Remember, like, the, remember, like, like six, seven years ago, like when you were wanting to talk about female horror directors, like the 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 most, <laughs> the, the the furthest you could turn your back for notable ones were maybe you know something like a, a Mary Heron for American Psycho or the chick that did Ravenous or you know you were talking early 2000s and then there was a gap um not anymore uh, like not anymore or the Soska sisters we'd always go back to well the twins you know what I mean but there was this huge gulf of them not now I mean just in the last six months I have seen um Saint Maud I've seen um the Relic as a female yeah. director, oh. um, you know what I mean, like up there, um, uh, and you know now swinging into to the stylist as well. There's well, a, and and even she of... dies tomorrow is like that's a super interesting movie. I, it's not fucking my... great movie. Yeah. yeah. So there's there are a ton of them out there just now, and most of them first time directors. Which once again, I I I love the idea because we're getting interesting voices into the genre, the genre that I love so much. So, yeah. uh, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, <laughs> Alan McPherson in, in chat uh, watching on YouTube saying, Circle of Life, take a shot. Uh, yep. Yeah. When that comes <laughs> up, anytime, anytime you hear its reference, uh, any part of the Lion King. Really. Duncan and Bull Bingo, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lori also uh, chiming in and, and uh, supporting you in your popcorn love because so, it's badass it's so. been a long time since i've seen that i don't i don't recall that movie being particularly good but um you know I, the thing that you go back it's got a quirk about it that i really like um for e i mean it's like 91 or something i think it's when that movie came out so long past when those sort of movies were being made really the like late 80s were kind of the end of the uh the slasher mm -hmm. as we understood it um and i think that's what maybe works with it plus it has i mean it's canadian as well so it's a bit of exploitation but also has a bit of the italian feel about it as well so it would pair really well with like like a movie like demons for example you could you could rock the two of them back to back and it would work out pretty great so there you go so let me entertain you <laughs> uh let me make you smile Oh, yeah, that's a difficult task. The wife's uh, been trying for years, Bo. Yeah, let me, all right, so let me make a, a confession here, Duncan. Oh, where are we going with this? Yeah. Oh, juicy <laughs> gossip. All right, everybody. Everybody get close. Get get close to your speakers. Um, so uh, my my uh, knowledge of the Brian De, Ta Brian De Palma filmography is a little spotty here and there, right? Like, I've seen a lot of the big ones. 
but sometimes you miss things. Wait one sec. Are you about to? Are you about to drop? A, I watched for the first time a De Palma movie. Yes. Oh, and one. I watched for the first time. I had never seen Blowout. Oh, right. that, like maybe my favorite De Palma movie. That was your yeah. first time. How have we known each other so long and you've never seen Blowout? It just again, it's just one of those movies that fell in between the the cracks. <laughs> And uh, and and also, I'm not crazy about Travolta as an actor, so I've always kind of had arm's distance. Yeah, but it's got Lithgow as the villain. Dude, Lithgow I didn't was know maybe that. the best villain ever. I didn't know that until I was watching it. I did not <laughs> oh, know that. Oh, he's Lith- so fucking good. <laughs> so yes, so I start watching this, and I'm like, John Lithgow's in this fucking movie. All right. And John Lithgow's in, like, shitloads of De Palma movies. Like, me and you need to speak after that. We might yeah. have to push up De Palma as a potential director conversation on Teapots. I right. know I swung it by earlier, but there is a ton of his performances which are fucking incredible. In that. I need to shut up so you can talk. No, 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 it's it's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so uh, I, I, of course, loved it. I mean, it's a great, it's a great movie. Um, but... So the whole time I'm like, this is really good. Lithgow's fucking amazing in this. Um, yeah, having a great time with it. And then like the last 15 minutes of that movie. Oh yeah. Hits, and I was like, oh fuck. I feel like a- devastated. I just got cratered by blowout. Like this movie that I was like, this is so like, it's really good. And it's so De Palma with the split screens and it's mm-hmm. tense and everything's really cool. And the lighting's great. And it looks amazing. And then it's it like De Palma just comes in and is like, no, 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 no. Let me just hit you in the stomach a couple of times real hard uh, for good Such measure. a fucking bleak ending. Like, yeah. it's, it's like <laughs> such a fucking... It's, that final shot yeah. of him using the sound effect is, is up there as one of the, yeah. the best gut punch endings in cinema. It, yeah, it's it's him saying, it's a good scream. It's a good scream. <laughs> that, like, that scene is like, what the fuck? Yeah, no, it's a good scream. Oh, it's so oh, good. It's God, such oh, a good, such a good movie. Like, so, and it's it's maybe I I I'm all, I always kind of go backwards and forwards on it, mm. but it's it's up uh, on any given day. If you were to pressurize me for an answer, um, I would I would probably say Blow It's my favorite De Palma. Man, I the thing is, so I just good, I dude. love Untouchable so so much. I it's, just... it's it's great, but I'm I, I'm gonna I, I don't know why I always go for it. I just love the construction of blow up. You know what I mean? I, I yeah, like I, sure. when I'm watching Untouchables. You know, it's I mean it's playing Footloose and Fancy Fancy Free with the Elliot Ness story, but you kind of know how that ends if you sit down and watch Untouchables for the first time. Yeah, kind of know how that one's ending. Um, but if you watch, like, no one, pre- you can never at any point predict where that movie's going. Even down to Lithgow as this, well, he's the he's the kind of assassin fixer guy. And then the point where they're like trying to call him off, and he's like, he just goes off. It's, right. It kind of reminds me of uh, No Country for Old Men when they're trying, yes, <laughs> they're trying yes, to get they're... our Ben back, and then he's just like, nope. I'm seeing this route and now I'm going to kill everyone that's employed me. <laughs> like, <laughs> the, the creepiest scene is when Lithgow is on the phone doing the confession to the sex yeah. killing. Yeah. But he's just dead eyed staring at Travolta the whole time. Mm-hmm. Where, like, you, there's just such a disconnect between the emotion coming out of his mouth and that flat, you know, great white shark expression that he has as he's looking at travolta it's it, it's an amazing performance it's and... the bit that i always get confused that when like when i can see why like if all you knew john lithgow from was like 38 was it third drop from the sun yeah, yeah, yeah right if that's all you knew him from when he was cast in dexter i could understand how you'd be like this is a career defining performance as the trinity killer but I grew up with them and Blowout and, you know, um, Raising Cain. Uh, you know what I mean? Like, I grew up with them as a creepy actor. So, yeah, I'd watched Harry and the Hendersons, but I grew up with them as a creepy, menacing... He's a tall guy, you know what I mean? He's And the way he talks and his mannerisms... Are like, so, to me, it was a perfect fit. But if you... Yeah, oh, dude, 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 dude. Um, have you ever Get seen out of here, obsession? John Travolta. Nobody wants you here anymore, John Travolta. Have you oh, ever seen Obsession? 
but yeah of course i've seen the conversation right yeah. no uh, obsession obsession oh obsession uh i don't think i have did we we uh, me you and doug tilly are gonna have to have a conversation all right all we right have to, we may have to to change things about there are, his early work is so fascinating like he's a run of movies like from the from like kind of mid 70s through that are just like from sisters basically from sisters sisters carry um phantom of the paradise obsession the fury uh like um a body double dressed to kill you know like just a fucking a laundry list of like this this guy is like this guy's like uh, it's why i always get annoyed when people do the whole well he's just he's just ripping off hitchcock anyone can rip off anything that doesn't mean that what comes out the end is quality or the ability to make it your own and that's what that's what he did he sadly has become pretty shit <laughs> when that happens. Right. with all directors over time they eventually just become a bit shit uh but it's but, like saying he ripped off argento like everybody was kind of pulling from hitchcock of course, and, and Argento ripped off from Hitchcock, <laughs> right? Like, uh, hit, like uh, Giallo is just a Hitchcock with more blood and less plot. Of course and... it is. Of course it is. I mean, like Bava, Bava is directly influenced by Psycho when he starts doing the very early Giallo. Of, yes, and then, of course. You know, like Argento then rips off Bava, and then before we know, it, we've come full circle. As yeah, oh, did did the um, circle of life. <laughs> <laughs> it's another shot to have been a fly on the wall while you watched you should have told me you were watching it it's legitimately one of my like me and like what what Jamie would you have done is, differently would you have been like i am gonna dude. i'm gonna like after this i'm gonna like and me you and jamie salmon's chat i'm gonna drop that like, it's one of her favorite movies ever made um, Yeah, it's great like i'm with you <laughs> what i love about it is i'm looking at the screen right now of our like our faces and uh knowing how that movie finishes with the the, <laughs> the old red white and blue and the fireworks and all the rest i'm just we i'm watching the flag way behind you all that something bad's going to happen to bo where he's going to hear me scream and have to use it as a sound effect <laughs> it's a good scream it's a good scream it's good scream good scream man uh, yeah, yeah really just how defeated well. he is as a person at the end oh, of that movie strong. it's just like he's going to be nothing but nicotine and bourbon for the rest of his life I might watch that tonight. You may have it's, inspired yeah, me to like yeah. watch it again. <laughs> but like I said, it was it was one of those that when it, it it popped up on some streaming service, and I was like, okay, enough fucking around. I need to I need to sit down and watch Blowout. I've, you know, yeah. it, it has been I've been adjacent to that movie so this for is so long. I this is the the see this is why I sometimes some people would say unfairly, or some people would say overreacting get on your case when you say well i watched paranormal warehouse seven this weekend and i'm like right yeah i understand that but there is a sea of blowout movies out there that you could be watching instead of fucking five toed yeah and i Mary, watch a lot of those was. movies i like like look that my diet of of cinema these days is like maybe once every week to 10 days i'll slip in a little shit <laughs> but you know it's like a cheat day most of the time i'm watching either good stuff or i'm watching something for review or whatever yeah. like something that i ought to be watching uh to one degree <laughs> as much as you should be watching any movie i suppose like I, nobody's holding a gun to my head for none of this really but um <laughs> you better watch crucified ransdale um <laughs> aka every bloody's end is the name of that movie it's an anyway we'll talk about that later um, it's another show <laughs> another yeah another time another show but so now when i watch uh something that's real shitty i just make sure that in between the shitty movies i'm watching like four or five things that are legitimately good yeah. so i'm i understand your point it is well taken <laughs> i have taken steps to improve uh my my cinematic diet uh robert saying so many ouija films so little time duncan i started a whole goddamn patreon show that is nothing but ouija experiment movies i and, i wish you would start that patreon for classic movies <laughs> i look because hey, then people are paying for you to watch classic movies as opposed to 
I would chip into that, boy. I'm if just <laughs> I'll tell you what, your name shows up on the Patreon list. You, you're goddamn right. I'll do. I'll do a movie that's just called "Movies Duncan Told Me to Watch." <laughs> start giving me five bucks a month, then you can start d- telling me what to watch. <laughs> to, 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 to then I get, I get, you get fucking criticized. Nothing, McLeish. Yeah, you get Try a Scottish face. hello, a punch right in a puss. <laughs> <laughs> so. Alan was asking if we've seen Hi Mom. I don't know what Hi Mom is. What's Hi Mom? Hi Mom. Hi Mom. I don't think I have. No. Yeah. No. Alan, Alan, get with the, the description. In the meantime, <laughs> hey, sometimes life throws problems at you and you need answers. Yes. When life gives you questions, you give them lemonade. Yes. That's the famous expression. <laughs> So a couple of questions uh, from, from our good pal Alan here, uh, yep. who we have just given homework and somewhat berated, so sorry about well, that. Well, yeah, I was about to say, we just, we just ridiculed one of his questions, which is, have you seen Hi Mom? Uh, right, that's maybe not Maybe we question. should read it back and then be pleasant, Bo, or stop complaining that we're not getting questions. Right. Uh, so he says uh, he and his wife have been watching a bunch of, quote, uh, modern women in peril slash survival slash revenge movies. Ooh, all yep. right. He says, don't Good ask. Light. Don't ask any questions, he says. I I got questions. Um, <laughs> he says, the, the first three we, we took in all featured a scene where the protagonist, or protagonist, um, suffers a fall from an impossible height that she survived. This fall also marks a story break where the hunter hunted starts to turn. And and he says, what up with like that? It's like an ancient Greek transformer. <laughs> Which one? On a guess. Pro, a protagonist yeah. ancient greek philosopher transformer just like, transforms into a statue holding a scroll with a tiny dick yeah just transfers into a somebody working a, a weight job <laughs> you know how much you get paid to be a philosopher he's like <laughs> i am i am here to take your order transformer but has uh, has no skills <laughs> Um, apparently it's De Palma's uh, first feature. I own De Palma's first feature as part of a box set, I think, so I've never seen it. Um, I think it's in the De Palma De Niro box set, I think. Maybe. I don't know. Possibly. Uh, well, if we're doing it, then we will be. If we do it as a director conversation, both me and Bo will have to see it. Um, I, I don't know. Like in, in reference to the question he's doing, like, it, it is a common theme. <laughs> like I totally like, forgot the question. I just asked it and I totally forgot it. Yeah, so it's, a, it's about the, the 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 woman falling from an impractical height as a way to originally sure. set up the like, escape. Revenge is the one that I remember most recently having. Well, yeah, I think, that, but I think there is. Through. I think there's a. I think that's is. I in my opinion, it's a lazy way of writing, but it's that way to. And I think he's he's accurate to point out. It's usually used as a mechanism to give the original escape you know she can't escape these over overbearing men characters so if she falls down something she's either left for dead or presumed dead or or, yeah i think there's also just that kind of natural story construction too of like you want to see your protagonist go mm. to their lowest point and then they build themselves up from it yeah they have to survive that to come out it's basically it's 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 the sort of you know the rape revenge or survival girl equivalent of the final girl stance of surviving being attacked by the killer earlier on in the slasher movie to defeat them at the end they have to go through that to understand yeah. how to survive and then come back to do it at the end. It's yeah, it is a it is a co- it is a commonality in a lot of those movies. And to be honest, I think it's not an, it, it, it's not egregious to me. But if you're watching a lot of them, I would imagine it becomes a bit oh, you know, it's like seeing it's it's like seeing an occult store or a Google. Uh, search pop up in a you know in a paranormal activity movie. <laughs> You're like, oh look, oh here they go. Right now they're googling their house, like as if they didn't do that before they fucking moved in. Right. Um, you know, as it can be a bit eye rolling, but if you're watching a lot of them, it's I suppose it, it, it kind of mounts up on top of each other. So let me, let me throw one other possibility out there. Do it, bro. And, and Rewrite it. When I, before I say this, I'm gonna say I know for a fact. 
uh, Lori uh, is in the chat. And so mm -hmm. c correct me if, if I am wrong. But I think there is also sort of that tra tradition, uh, a sad tradition, but a tradition nonetheless of, of of sort of real world stories of here was a woman who was abducted, raped, and left for dead. Yeah, and and this is the third part of that, right? Is yeah, you know the the assault, and then hey, we're gonna throw them in a ditch, down a ravine, whatever, because it's just sort of the that is the story that you're used to hearing like since what the 60s or 70s yeah and it was oh, sort yeah, of yeah, the yeah, rise definitely. of that idea of holy shit like if you are a woman and you are alone you know like that most of these movies i think are kind of intended for women even though they're they're presented salaciously and so forth uh they're you know not so much the modern ones like revenge is definitely a far cry from uh, like I spit on your grave or something. Yeah, yeah. But but there is that whole idea of look, guys, if you can't keep it in your fucking pants and you and you sexually assault someone, if <clears throat> I guess the the moral is make sure they're dead. Well, it's it's the it's the part of like if you're following if you're trying to follow the the, the kind of psychological pattern of who would do that, can the post the rape um it's the trying to hide the crime then which you've committed yes right, right, um, right you know or almost the shame of the act itself you know um mm -hmm. so there, there is an element of that it, you can go the other like i, I was thinking of while we were chatting ready or not is essentially a yeah. movie it's a survival movie and in that one she's given a head start so i mean that's that's the other way around very much like and i can see the three movies that is well i can see two of the three movies uh, hunt, uh hunted is the other one isn't it um yeah, the hunt, hunted sorry, and what the, you need the, to survive yeah. or the... well the hunt is another one where well you've got although it was a group of people that are hunted in that one it's a similar kind of concept idea to ready or not in that you know it's the most dangerous game we're going to hunt you you get a head start so um I don't know. I think if I think if you're doing the kind of rape revenge angle in a movie, there will always be that. And I think you're right, Bo. There's always it's going to be predicated on that. The bad thing happens. The guy who has committed the act um, is is going to try and um, move the the crime out of sight, and that usually means dumping in a ditch or off somewhere else uh, to continue their normal life. Um, which is why I love the movie Catelyn Varga. So, Alan, if you're taking notes, Catelyn Varga is Peter Strickland's first movie. It's set in, um, I want to say it's Hungary, it's, it's set in, and you have, it's a rape revenge movie, but it's incredibly well done. And it starts with a woman who's married and she's got a son and she's harboring a secret. The secret is that her son is actually the product of a rape, but she's passed it off as the you know this is you know she got married and it's her husband's son uh because of the the way the time worked out she you know hur hurried into a marriage so she could pass it off because of how society will treat her and of course this news she she accidentally confides in someone like nine years on and it spreads around the town and she's basically ostracized from the town so she goes on a trip for revenge to find the person who who did it um and in the case of that one, it was, you know, the, 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 the setup is basically he raped her outside the bar and just because the culture being the way it is, you know, it's, it's rural life. It's out in the, the, whatever the hills are there. It's not the Urals, but it's, it's something along those lines. You know, it's just that like small village thing and she was passing through and who's going to believe her. And, you know, she's left to basically pick up the pieces of her life and move on. So I love that as a setup because it is very much against pretty much everything Alan's seen in all, all his movies and that it's just part and parcel that she's a woman. So by default, she's not a lower peg in that country, um, you know, in that society specifically uh, and how she picks up her life. But then her transformation of, well, actually, I've had to live with this for all this time and now I'm going to seek this person out and get my revenge is done in a completely different way. So the, there are examples of it out there. They're just few and far between. I think it just comes down to that we have a formula that kind of works in these movies. Um, narratively, like Bo says, it, it works. It's the A to B to C. 
sort of combo in the writing, so we're just going to use it. Um, I think you'll get that if you watch almost it. Like, I was thinking about this while you were describing some of the things as well, but I think if you pick any subgenre and you, you run a lot of them back to back, you're good. Like, I watch a lot of Jalo movies and <laughs> a lot of the same conceits come up over and over and over and over again to the point where you can actually anticipate this is, you know, at this point here, we're going to get the clue. And at this point here, this clue is going to lead to this, but that's going to be the red herring. And it's actually going to be, you know, you can start to piece it together. It's just the the negative aspect of watching a lot of very similar movies, which are by their very nature, most likely all playing off the 70s rape revenge movies, which were, to be honest, one hits and then all the other movies start to copy. So you're basically just getting the same version of the same story done over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's an element too, I think of um, treating, uh, treating the woman as something that is disposable and then yeah. having them, again especially the modern films of being able to sort of take control back from the men in their lives and be able yeah. to assert themselves and uh you know especially something like the movie revenge which was directed by a woman i think a, a lot of those rape revenge films have sort of been reappropriated by a lot yeah. of really interesting female directors who are like i was thinking american mary actually when we were chatting yeah yeah, uh, which is a, I think is a really good example of that. Although, I, if memory serves, that has a similar conceit as well about how the the woman's. It's been a while since I saw that movie, but I I, I remember something about you know her being kind of dumped and left for dead as well. So, um, and Laurie kind of confirming for me that yeah, that's sort of, you know, kind of part and parcel with with being a lady, is just yeah. sort of having that kind of vague sense of like just be on your toes because if you fuck up, like there could be a dude that wants to rape yeah. you. Which is, I mean, I mean, it's just a nightmarish thought. But Horrific is what it yeah. is. Like, no um, one should, no one should have to to have that. Even as a, no one should go through life even remotely having that as a potential thought in the back of their head. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, it, it's like human nature is just terrible. It's a, the reason yeah. the fly is so scary. It's not because he's turning into a fly. It's because yeah. he's becoming, you know, an adolescent male. Um, yeah. But he also likes what he's becoming as well. Which yeah, is... Right, right. He becomes the sexual predator. Um, yeah. Anyway, enough about how great Cronenberg is. Uh, oh, one of pivoted to Cronenberg, take a shot. Yeah, right. Uh... <laughs> they full on the bingo. It'd just be Fellates Cronenberg, um, <laughs> which is true. Uh, but also, a, a quick answer to Laurie's question. Yes, I have seen Saint Maud. I talked to Duncan about it a little bit offline. I'm not going to talk about it on the show today because, like I told him, I just watched it last night. I'm still kind of living with it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but it was it's very good. If you haven't seen St. Maud, see St. Maud. Uh, the way that movie was treated in the United States was dirty. That movie got did dirty in the States. I, I still don't understand what's it's, going on there it's at so, all. It's an American, it's an American finance movie. It's yeah. not a... It's, you know, there's there was no issues with it getting well there was obvious issues it was delayed over here but it did get a very limited cinematic run it was available on blu-ray before it made its way in fact i've had this for weeks now for about two weeks that's the saint mod steelbook yeah so i mean and I, if you are a company like e24 and you release it in a physical medium in one country or digital and it, it's going to be pirated so I don't understand. I don't understand the thought process behind it at all. Especially from that label, it seems very strange. It does make me a bit concerned because they have other movies which are going to go through similar situations this year. So yeah, it well, and also on the back end, like they did a limited theatrical run starting a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, and but on the back end of that, it released straight to Epics which is a channel yeah. nobody's got except now because they got St. Maud early, but you can't yeah. get it anywhere else on VOD. So, right. Which is like, it. what are you doing? Why are you hiding this movie? I hope Epic's paid you millions and millions of dollars. <laughs> and maybe they did. Maybe it was just like, look, we're going to back a dump truck full of money and hope that a bunch of horror nerds like myself are going to subscribe for the, you know six bucks a month yeah well i hope to, they take that money and subscribed i hope they take that money and they use that money to finance rose glass's next movie because that i feel so sorry for her yeah that 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 movie was going to get a big push last april so almost a year ago that was supposed to come out right um it was going to get a huge push and 
you know, she'd basically have to, she's had to sit and kind of watch it not go anywhere uh, for a long period of time. So I don't, I, yeah, I don't know if there will be some, some person out there that can explain the, you know, the release logic of what they've done. But to me, I think they have, they have grossly uh, mishandled the whole thing. So. But yeah. then I don't have my own studio bow, so I don't <laughs> it, Right. It's I, like I said, I think Epic's just had to have been like, we are going to give you so much money. We're yeah. going to make it worth your while. At some point, it'll be, uh, be available, I'm sure, on Amazon and Apple and all that stuff where you can just rent it for four or five bucks or whatever. Uh, but you can't do that right now. You got to subscribe to Epic's if you want to see it in the States or go to the very few theaters that are open that are showing. Yeah. It. Um, yeah. Don't elite, don't pilot but, this movie. Please don't pilot this me, movie. Yes, please don't. Please don't. Uh, if because now you can watch this on on Epics. But let me let me tell you guys something oh from your old pal Bo from personal experience. Getting that goddamn Epics app to connect and work on on a device like I have almost every kind of streaming device you can think of. Um, and I had to, it, it worked on the Roku. Uh, the app did not work on the Xbox. Uh, there's not one for the PlayStation. Um, there, I think you can get one for Google play and Android and stuff like that, but mm -hmm. I don't want to watch this on the tablet. I don't want to watch it on my big screen. Duncan, I don't want to see yeah. this on a, oh, no, I'm I'm I don't want to see the this on my <laughs> damn fo fucking, fucking phone. phone. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> take a shot there. Um, and so I, it, it was incredibly frustrating to be like, before we did that test last night, I was just trying to get the app working Ugh. and I was like, okay, I've, I, I had like, I had to go hook up the Roku streaming stick that I got for some reason a year ago, probably cause I was drunk. Uh, I probably ordered it late one night and then, uh, but that wouldn't power to the tv right because it uses a usb power connection Ugh. so i had to run an extension cord to to get the roku stick to plug in to the tv and also have the appropriate power mm -hmm. and then i could watch saint Maud. i was about to say like while we were talking then i actually think a24 it's i think studio canal is a distributor over here which might yeah. be why it's been treated differently because Studio Canal does a lot of A24 stuff over here. Um, I, I just I, like the streaming services and the opportunities and uh, and all that should be uncomplicating <laughs> and unjumbling the system of distribution. Um, the fact that people are still making it very difficult to do things is a clear understanding that is forward. Um, thinking and progressive we are getting with our, 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 you know, our way to consume media, there are still people that are needlessly making things complicated. Right. And after complaining about how hard it was to install an app to uh, a, a streaming device, uh, we're going to take a quick five minutes so I can also yell at the kids to get off my lawn with their hula hoops. Off my lawn! You get kids! <laughs> but look at you! Just look at you! Out there hula hooping all day. <laughs> There's Don't you know it's Irish cold? Coming in here. <laughs> You're hula hooping in the snow. Don't you have any sense? <laughs> hula hooping in the snow. One of the few uh, Akira Kurosawa movies that never got yeah. a release. It was uh, an interesting B-side by the Beach Boys. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's enough dumb jokes for now. We'll be back <laughs> in about oh, two minutes with more dumb jokes. <laughs> Too young, too scared I wasn't ready, I'm restless Longing inside my body Growing stronger Could you release stronger? Could you release me? Say Oh, we're back <laughs> Dear What? I don't know if I like that <laughs> You don't like it when we, when we get down, when we get sexy, Duncan? Yeah, I want to make love to you, woman. I want to lay it down by the fire. I want to lay it down by the slasher. <laughs> oh, God, this show is dumb. <laughs> you don't say. Um, <laughs> it's really, 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 really dumb. 
So this episode, Duncan, episode four, we are in episode four of this show. Halfway mark, Bo. Halfway mark. Yeah. Finally. Uh, <laughs> right, which is, which, which feels good, uh, but also it's encouraging because that means, oh, we can do the, this whole series pretty fast. Yes. Um, so. But there are two others after this. <laughs> well, right, but leading, leading Duncan Here's what's going to happen is we're going to do all of these fucking slasher seasons. Mm -hmm. We're going to get to season four and David Cronenberg is going to show up and be like, yeah. well, it was good being in your show and then immediately murdered. If, if it's a fucking five second cameo, Bo, I am going to tear this motherfucker down. We will, we will burn it all down. <laughs> um, the title of this episode is as water is corrupted unless it moves. Uh, you know, I think they mean pee. I think it, the, it's about pee pee. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, Duncan? You're right. Um, <laughs> so, uh, let's start. Uh -huh. Brenda, uh, our favorite character, is like we get an opening montage of her just being cremated. Yep. Because you know? we don't spend any time doing any investigation in this town. When someone dies, no. then they're either buried, they're in the ground, or dust. One of the two. Yeah, we like we have a funeral the next day. As someone who has had to like kind of organize and plan a funeral, it don't happen that quick. Uh, I'm also going to say that like there has been money spent on this one because that urn is not cheap. Dude, all right, let me say this. This <laughs> hand of God, this is true. As I was watching this, I was like, boy, that's a shitty particle board coffin they got her. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh, they're cremating her. And then you see him, like, dumping the ashes into the urn. I was like, that's the urn I've got. Well, like, it's not for me, but I have an urn with a person's ashes in it that looks a lot like that urn. Onesies. <laughs> right. So, so I got the urn out. I was like, see? <laughs> it's like you. It's like having a dog on screen, and you get your dog to see if they see each other and want to talk. Yeah, we can't have any animals at all in front of the pug on telly because he goes mental. That really? Yeah, he, wa he actively watches anything that's on the telly. Like the other, the chihuahuas don't. They they couldn't give a fuck. Um, but the pug actively watches. Like if there's a horror movie on, you get all the kind of. <laughs> <laughs> does not that's fucking amazing like, he's, but he's like actively you can tell he's watching everything that's happening is nuts um yeah so just stop barking at things <laughs> can't keep the cats awake <laughs> they do not they do not sit still for a movie yeah one thing that i thought specifically in this episode kicking off out with the fact we're getting a quick burial um is the needless nature of this in general I don't know if we physically have to see every character get buried. Plus, we spent so little time with our favorite character that it kind of uh, felt like uh, <laughs> never. In but there are a few characters in the history of anything where the phrase "ashes to ashes" was yeah. more appropriate. <laughs> it's, it's like it's like you're you're watching it going. Um, I was kind of watching it like they would have been better just doing previously on slasher man um, i god I, wh why do they not do a previously on slasher because here's the problem with with doing our show kind of you know roughly bi-weekly yeah uh bi-weekly curious even um mm -hmm. is that <laughs> about 45 minutes after i watch an episode of slasher i could not tell you the first thing that happened on that episode <laughs> of slasher <laughs> so <laughs> Can I, I have that disorienting kind of woozy feeling that I used to in between seasons of Game of Thrones, like when you would come back, you're right. like, who's that guy? Who's that guy? <laughs> what did they do? But there was a year in between them, or sometimes longer, bro. Boy, yeah, speaking of, where the fuck has June been hiding for this whole season? I was like, who? Huh? Hey June, who? <laughs> yep, so I took, but I didn't. I warned, didn't I? Like as soon as we got the previous reveal that it was going to be yes, they have a set. As soon as that formula was laid bare, I told you every episode now is going to be 
someone's either just died or someone is about to die and we find that they're murky past yeah. and by the end of the episode it's all wrapped up and that is literally the formula and I couldn't give a fuck about it um, I like genuinely could not care and that's that's the issue that we hit straight away with after all the previous episodes pivoting and manoeuvring and limbering up to give us a definite red herring of, well, Trent's the killer. Look at him as he guts these animals. We transition pretty quickly from the urn to the demise of the the, the, the character of Trent. There's, all right, we there's one episode, or one episode, one, it felt like an episode, one scene <laughs> in between those two, though. The connective oh. tissue between those two is that we cut to Sarah just sitting in bed looking at her the one picture on her phone apparently which was her. taken just before like it was taken <laughs> that day on set because right. that's how fucking fresh it looks and she's just like oh boy oh boy she she had herself a green thumb she did and you're like she did all right and then dylan like comes in and he's she like <laughs> hey you talking about how good she was at gardening baby yeah <laughs> Oh, I sure was. Look, this is my favorite picture of her. She had a fucking yellow thumb from chain smoking. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. She, had, she had fucking yellow eyes from fucking liver damage as well from very much she drank. If she's fucking trying to green about her. <laughs> she's growing cartons of Virginia Slims. Yeah, she's got a real magic touch, this one. And, <laughs> and, and so... And Sarah is like, boy, I, I, I think we're going to be scattering her ashes in the garden, you know, on account of how much she loved it. She loved that garden. Remember all that time she spent in the garden moaning about you being an inconsiderate lover? <laughs> yeah. And then as they're chatting about that bullshit, you're also, like... I also love the fact that, like, from his perspective, let's put it this way. We didn't cover this. He... Like, he has basically won the lottery because his wife's back uh -huh. and she was leaving him. And what, what was the whole purpose of him staying? What did he say, uh, the owner of the paper say in the previous episode? One more murder and we break to the big time. So not only did he get yeah. that one more murder, but it was the person that was trying to sabotage his marriage. It was right. an in-law. He he's like, I'm walking on sunshine. <laughs> Everything is coming up, Dylan. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And... <laughs> And while they're kind of chit chatting about all this bullshit with like where we're, we're gonna scatter the ashes the day after she died, Ugh. um, I, uh, by the way, if if you're gonna scatter my ashes, Duncan, scatter mm -hmm. them directly into the face of my enemies. Um, you know, well, I mean, I, I, That's I can read between it. the I can read between the, the lines, Paul. Wow, it was always the plan, right? Whether you're you like, consented oh, or not. <laughs> what was that? Hoping that you wouldn't be for it. <laughs> <laughs> Bo says hello one last time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Choke on it. <laughs> Choke on it. <him. laughs> that, that's what I want on my urn. I want you to inscribe that. Choke on him. <laughs> I just, I just, I'm really looking forward to the conversation that I have with your family post your death as the ashes are in there and where they're like that. No, he was clearly having fun with you. It was clearly a joke on the recording of me going, no, I will respect my dead friend's wishes. Let me state this for the record. No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> it's all the evidence I need. To be honest, I was going to fabricate that. I was just going to have it going. No, I'm not kidding. You know, one of those deep things where you like throw my head on Imelda Marcos or whatever. <laughs> I like shoes. That's all I know about Imelda Marcos. I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have used that as the reference point. It was a that terrible was reference point. I'm I, glad that you went with it though and pushed forward regardless. So, so Cam <laughs> shows up just, hello. Yeah, like, <laughs> I hope I'm yeah. not interrupting anything. Policeman and, killer. Policeman killer. <laughs> right. <laughs> Hello, secret villain of the show. <laughs> and and he shows up just to tell him, like, not because... I, like, I, you're going to have to explain this to me. I don't understand why Cam is showing up to be like, hey, we found Trent McBride's truck out near the boat dock, so we're pretty sure he killed your mom. You know, just something we're going to let you know. We're not sure or nothing. We're just looking into it. Yeah, because we, we're setting like up... 
yeah, we're setting up this as a potential red herring at the start of this episode and removing this as a potential red herring within three minutes. The very Only next Slasher scene. can do this. Only Slasher can do this. Yeah, because well. uh, Cam, <laughs> a.k.a. the Executioner, is like, uh, <laughs> say, we're, we're looking for your friend Trent right, right, right now. And then they cut to the woods where Trent is just uh, like walking around with a rifle. Yeah. And he's about to shoot a deer, and before he can he can pull the trigger, a a shot rings out and it scares off the deer. And he's like, "Hey, I, I was about to shoot that deer. How, that's fucked up." And and <laughs> camera pans round, and there's another deer with a rifle using it to save his friends. Right. A You're bunch welcome, of them, kid. like it was it was all a trap. Uh, so human. See if the reveal at the end of this show is that the executioner is actually a deer. That would be the best ending ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was you, Bambi. <gasps> <laughs> it was me all along, you son of a bitch. You killed you my see? mother. <laughs> you don't remember me. My name is Bambi. <laughs> so, somewhere right now, there's a Disney lawyer ready to sue. Um, right. He's not and, sure when he can when he can pull the trigger, but he's ready for it. And right, this is the the Zack Snyder Bambi, where like the mother gets shot at the beginning. Bambi, in true like Survivor film fashion, gets thrown into a ditch, left for dead, and then yep. he has to you with the help of his uh, pals Thumper and uh, uh, Rosebud, uh, he <laughs> learns karate and how to be strong. And you then, missed the bit. You missed it a bit when his mother was shot, and he was like. Martha! Right. <laughs> Still never like, watched that movie. It, like, I just got told that and I was like, nah, I'll never watch that movie. The fact that they're they're coming out with this four hour Snyder cut of of Justice League, I'm like, you could keep all of that. That yeah. sounds w- like way too long to be watching that movie. I saw Ugh. like you know what what my thought was coming out of that movie was not, hey, that'd be better if you made it a whole bunch longer. <laughs> that was short. <laughs> yeah. No, it was already long and tedious. I don't need I don't need it to be any longer. Anyway. Ah, uh, you people. Uh so not you listeners and, and viewers, you guys We are, love you. Yeah, you're smart and attractive. Um <laughs> surprisingly attractive. I'm a little erect. Yes, though I am fact scarily. Suspiciously. Yeah. So it it turns out though it's not a deer, it's uh the black condom, aka the executioner. Well he falls over into a hole, right? Oh my god. And Duncan. then he's like, Oh, someone help me. He falls over and he's badly damaged his leg, which from the aerial position of it is just moved just a little bit. And this does not stop him getting up. I mean, the fall couldn't have broke his back or anything. You could still move, mm-hmm. but no, he's gonna lie there as the executioner comes up. Carrying himself a good old sack, um, and <laughs> old-fashioned bag of snakes. Yep, he, he brings out a bag of snakes. Which once again, this guy, right, his leg is badly damaged, but the rest of him is fine. So as the snakes are getting dropped down, I'd be throwing them back. <laughs> like, drop. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> like, you have snakes. <laughs> you can have it back. Nope. Nope to this, nope, rock. Yeah. Um, Bat you know, it you know, down. Like, no, thank like, you, what, sir. What they missed was the great opportunity <laughs> for the executioner to be walking away and all of a sudden this, like, you know, like MacGyver esque, <laughs> like snakes being tied into a rope, you know, to lasso to pull him out. Yeah. Like, Trent's a fucking hunter, right? And you've seen all the stuff he's done to animals, right? So I would assume Survivor. You know, this guy can take care of himself, is used to being out of the wilderness, becomes a bit of a punk bitch as soon as he falls, right? As soon as he falls into that hole, yeah. he's punk bitch material, and the snakes are on him, and he's like, oh, this. like, no setup that he had a fear of snakes or anything. You know, it, it just, he just freezes pretty much in place, and uh, the executioner watches on as the credits roll. And Duncan was thinking to himself, why did we spend the previous scene talking about how Trent could be the killer if we are going to remove that? Unless, and then I had hope here, Bo. Mm-hmm. I thought, I see what they've done. This is a smart TV show. Trent's body will not be found, thus setting them up as the red herring. 
Ah, yeah. Couldn't have been more wrong. Couldn't have been more wrong if I tried because when the credits finish, what did they find? Trent's fucking body. Yeah. I'm like, it's... what are we doing here? <laughs> they might as well just have someone come out on screen and be like, guess what happened, you guys? <laughs> We got another scene to do in a minute, but Trent, you know, the guy we saw in the last episode that looked all scary and it had the taxidermy and all that. You guys remember that? So uh, the executioner killed him and then the cops find his body. So uh, uh, moving on. He, I was thinking, like, if you're like, if you're an actor reading this script, like you're like, oh, I get set up to be the killer. Oh, this could be really cool. And then if you turned over the next page and it was like that. I am dead. Police find me. Yeah, literally the next page. It's narratively unsatisfying. I'll, I'll tell you the other thing that really cracked me up in this scene, Duncan, <laughs> is when the uh, the dark condom throws mm -hmm. uh, snakes onto Trent in his Dunboco branded bag of snakes available now. Yes, you, you can buy one. Nineteen ninety nine. <laughs> it's a variety pack of snakes. We can't guarantee yeah. which ones you're gonna get. Handle yeah. with care. Please um, do. Please do. Not liable. Yes. Oh, 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 no. No, no. As soon as you <laughs> ordered this thing, it is on you. We have, we lawyered up real good on that. Um, But, but yeah, it's like five snakes and yeah. it's like a real chintzy amount. It would yeah. be like if like uh, Indy falls into the well of souls and it's like <laughs> three snakes that you see at the local circus yeah. or some shit. <laughs> Hey, uh, <laughs> like, we found these in the backyard and even we'll get to it in a second but even when uh chief brimley is like bunch of goddamn normal snakes hey eh? bunch of garter snakes and black racers eh? oh, we used dead, to use dead. these for <laughs> used to jump rope anyway the, so the sheriff the sheriff is is he's replaced um the grandmother is my favorite character in this he's pretty he's good so and everybody gives him good. shit but he's always right but he's got the best, he's got one of the best lines coming out. He basically says to her, you know, I, like, uh, and I know you don't think I can do my job. Well, guess what? I don't give a shit. <laughs> Man, like, yes. Right. Yeah. There is a real, like, grandpa energy about that. Like, hey, guess what? I got a little surprise for you. I don't give a shit. God damn it. It's, it's the best. We'll get there. We'll get there. You see what it says here? Sheriff. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh cam and uh a lady cop show up with backup at trent's place to start looking around and immediately are like hey we can't find him in the house oh wait let's get the dogs cut to hey here's the body yeah like, like cam is almost like the, the, we're two steps away from cam leading the dogs to the body <laughs> right no, it's this way guys <laughs> wait a second i think i smell something everybody i got it all right just all four sniffing around like a Ken Russell movie or something. <laughs> um, anyway, so we cut over to Sheriff Brimley's office and Dylan and Sarah there. And that's where he's like, yo, bunch of goddamn black racers. Yeah, like and, but, literally explain, showing them the photos and explaining yeah. to them. And I'm like, why would, why, one, why are we explaining to her anything? gallery shop owner <laughs> like like that's not how that works too the press is in the room right like i understand that this is the granddaughter here but right you don't just call them in and be like well let me share all the the gruesome details of the case god damn it come here pull up a yeah, chair i'm gonna bring in my my staunch uh you know uh, the, the dissenting voice against my leadership as, as sheriff in the town right. and basically tell them how my theory is wrong uh, and have the press there while we're at it. Um, I, I just, it, 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 it boggles the mind. And what I love is how, like, how like, Sarah is just, you know, oh, so we're back to square one again. And I'm like, yes, that's how cases work. You think someone did something when it's proved that they didn't do it, you're back to square one. Like that's right. that's how an investigation works. You wouldn't know that painter. Um, you know, like see when you're finished making a painting, you don't then start on the next painting, which is pre-painted. You start again from scratch. <laughs> My, you're right. The other hilarious bit in this scene, though, is when uh, he's describing the list of snakes that they found. Where he's just like, <laughs> "Look, uh, about six of them were completely harmless. Like you can mm -hmm. pick them up and." You know, uh, put them in your jock strap if you want to. Uh, uh, totally fine, and uh, it might be a little impressive, goddamn it. But uh, uh, there's one as from Australia, poisonous as shit. Yep. Now, 
we think that's the one that killed him. And you're like, what do you think? <laughs> well, he shows, he shows her it. And she, she talks about the snake as well. And he's like, that, yeah. The second most deadliest behind the Taiwanese whatever like that. He's like, right. he, like he's looking at us as if to say, oh, yeah, I've done my homework. <laughs> like, yeah, right. I don't think about fucking snakes. And then he talks about their expert. I'm like, who is their snake expert? Jimmy, who, like, he really likes those David Attenborough d- documentaries. But, but, like, I, I was thinking, I genuinely thought to myself, they've just found what, because this show has no concept of time, right? So the body has just been yes. found. They're just in this room, and they've already got sign-off from a snake expert? Yeah, they immediately so, called a, a herpetologist. and. But, uh, like, like so she's like, oh, oh, so we're back to square one again, are we? Um, and he's like, listen, I know you're not happy with me no, you're not happy with my department but guess what i don't give a shit yeah <laughs> so thank yeah, you lucky for you- me i don't give a good goddamn how about that <laughs> and then big on off you fuck and yeah. cast so- him out the office pretty much yeah. like get out. kicks him out on the street where they just keep bitching about him dylan yep. and sarah do and dylan's like hey i got a good idea baby how about <laughs> How about I interview you and you can get your side of the story out and we can really like drag Chief Brimley uh, in the local paper. That'll mm-hmm. probably help our cause. And she's like, oh, let me think on it. Well, <laughs> well, because originally it's pivoted that you should speak to the press. And then she's like, well, I don't want to speak. And he, he plays this majestically. He's like, that. Oh, well, I could do the interview. You know what I mean? You're looking for you. Your husband's a reporter. And that way you can get your side the story out um so what she decides to do is once again right from the pages of mind hunter uh not mind hunter man hunter um she's like you know like she's two steps away from saying yeah the guy's a closet homosexual and you know all that she's basically like the executioner anyone that takes a life is a coward right and this is instantly printed right and because once again no concept of time yeah it's instantly, instantly printed. yeah it's only written printed <laughs> has come and in out. the hands in yeah. the hands of the serial the town serial killer who does <laughs> i'm a coward <laughs> right loses his shit yeah what is he shit man i'm like what why why do you even fucking care like what what is this what is this to you like like what, what i i know what it is to you right but it's you... his daughter that's I'm why like, yeah, this, I mean, he, this episode, if they're trying to be fucking sneaky about this... Oh, no, this they, 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 they put their cards on the table yes. at a point here with, with uh, hair clippings. Um, but, like, like so he, he loses his shit. And I'm like, I suppose I should give a fuck about this. Maybe. I don't know. Like, he's he's losing. He's like, I can't, can't believe he's being called a coward by, you know, whatever. And then we transition away from that. But I was thinking to myself, it'll be interesting to see what their next altercation comes at, which, by the way, is done via phone, at which time he has calmed down. <laughs> right. It's a quick, pill. like, you know, oh, sorry, I called you a coward. <laughs> oh, no problem. <laughs> it's fine. I was hot around the collar, but. <laughs> could, could you, could you imagine? I'm fine now, Sarah. <laughs> Hannibal Lecter losing his shit. <laughs> I'll have, yeah. You've really, you've really steamed my hands, Clarice. <laughs> they, they, they said that I overcooked the singer's lungs. Ah! <laughs> <Okay>. Yeah. <laughs> Called me a coward. <laughs> my human ratatouille was over seasoned. <laughs> I've changed my mind. I won't help you catch them, Clarice. How do you like those apples? I always cook my pasta al dente, goddammit. Too soft. <laughs> al dente means soft to the tooth. You uncouth bastard. <laughs> That's the show I want to see. I want to see Hannibal Lecter just getting in. I want to see Hannibal <laughs> Lecter critiquing restaurant food in the style of Gordon Ramsay. The great British cannibal off. <laughs> like, uh, let me sit down and try this man's pancreas, and it's fucking raw. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you've all been given a human liver pate <laughs> and, a, and a set of Legos. <laughs> Let's see what you bakers can create. I'm looking forward to the butt cheek beef Wellington. Mm. 
<laughs> oh, oh, that does sound good. Quite frankly, uh, yeah, yeah. Served Plenty with an au jus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if you get it wrong, it's all you. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the That's... show. Like, if you if you don't pass the test, you're Hannibal the Lecter eats you. <laughs> you're you're the next episode. <laughs> 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 you know, As you all remember know. your your former opponent here, Jim, who cooked poorly last week. Um, we will be taking advantage of his dead body now uh, to prepare this week's challenge. I, I think after we we tried Emily's cupcakes, we can all agree she is serving us better now than she ever did when she was alive. <laughs> it's a sick burn that we expect from Hannibal Lecter, <laughs> right? Um, so yeah, you've so just, this, it's just... You, you've just been Hannibal. <laughs> it's just the thing, it's just it's just a lot i was gonna say it's just a lot of shite it really is it's the thing that kind of frustrates and it's not the dumbest thing that happens in this episode we're gonna to get to no. um we're gonna to get to the the very loose reasoning behind the killing of trent which makes zero fucking sense in the grand scheme of egregious egregious events happened by sinners Mm-hmm. Uh, like which all again, once again is all tangential. Purchase some property and the former owners died. Uh, it's a killable offense in this show. And, <laughs> and right. this one, and also and with one. they have like the big reveal of the video too. It's like, oh, so it was fine. Okay. Anyway, so let's cut over to Allison and Dylan, who, by the way, we learned for sure. That Allison hired Dylan, mm-hmm. and she owns the paper, which we always suspected, but no one had ever said. I'm glad four episodes in, they're finally clearing this up. Yeah, it's <laughs> no time like the present, Duncan. And so they work out, they're, like, it's a big meeting where it's like, what's going on the front page? And Dylan's like, how about those murders, baby? And yeah. she, she's like, she's well. She's arguing an environmental concern, which, once again, she was the one trying to keep him in the previous episode from leaving because we could be writing another murder article are are you trying to suggest for one second duncan that characters do not behave consistently in this show i no i'm not i'm not suggesting <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm saying <laughs> i'm saying so, fact <laughs> so I'm like it's like it says is like he's like what do you think you know coastal erosion or or murder and i'm like where's the fucking coast here in this town there was a lake like just like, why the fuck? It, like why are we even discussing coastal erosion? Bullshit. Yes, the, the it's it's a stupid idea to put this on the front page when there is literally a murder that happened yesterday or two days ago or three years ago yeah, or however we long don't have it's a clue. Time is a flat circle, bro. <laughs> yeah, and Allison is like, you know, hey, I need to keep you after class, Dylan, because you're fucking being a real dick these days. Yeah, and he's like, listen. Lisa Ann Fellows is coming in from New York and he's like Lisa Ann Fellows and you're like as a viewer Lisa Ann mm-hmm. Fellows yeah oh, yeah and so she's a big deal journalist and and she's like Allison tells him we're going to dinner tonight and you're coming with me because Lisa Ann Fellows is going to be there and she is like if you want to take your career to the next level she's a big journalist and she can help you get there yeah and once again, I'm thinking, why? You, right. Once again, I don't understand the motivation here. Right. Out with like, she's the owner of the paper. If anything, she wants to keep him at that paper. But it seems like she's wanting him to make the move to the big leagues, which I don't think benefits her paper unless she's trying to get rid, or there's a finder's fee or fucking something. But then she's like, wear something tight, and I'm like that. Yeah. In 2021, that's class the sexual harassment so but dylan's sure fine with it. he's like you got it baby yeah he's like yeah wink wink um what you mean so you mean <laughs> dick tight or peck tight because i can so, do both both so we're, once again, we're, set, we're setting up we're setting up dylan as a new potential although he technically is but it's a, a, a shitty way to try about three times in this episode to say maybe it's dylan maybe and yeah. i'm just like oh fuck off fuck off right because I, uh, whatever um but yeah so we're going to follow this storyline through and we're going to chop this up to the storyline one of the many storylines i couldn't give a fuck about couldn't care about dylan 
He's, the, he's no. the, a pointless character at this stage. Um, even more so coming up <laughs> when we realise that he's been naughty, Bo, in the background. He's been doing things for a while. <laughs> right. Oh, well, oh, we'll get to that stupid reveal. <laughs> so, Sarah, we cut over to Sarah, who is in the gallery unwrapping some paintings, and she gets a call <laughs> and that's like, uh, hi, this is a phone call from the local uh, serial killer here at jail. Will yeah, you accept who happens the charges? to have your mobile number because there's no issue with that at all. Right. He's just going to call you out of the blue sometimes. We hope that's cool. And she's like, <laughs> yeah, all right. I'll pay for it. I'll and, speak to the man who murdered my parents and then cut me out of her room. Yeah, let's do this. I'll and, be fine. And he's like, <laughs> hello, Sarah. <laughs> I, uh, I read what you wrote in the paper. Called me a coward, eh? And she's like, yeah, and I meant it too. <laughs> To be, like, sure, to be sure, <laughs> to be sure. To be sure. And he, he's like, um, all right, fair enough. Well played. <laughs> yeah, remember when he was tearing up the room five minutes ago? He's calmed down now. He's just, just going to accept it. Okay. So yeah. it wasn't a misprint. You didn't see uncowardly and they accidentally wrote the wrong thing. Yeah, he's totally kind of internalized it. He's cool with it now. And, uh, and she, she's, like, so taken aback by how cool he is with it. She's like, say, what you be wanting to do an interview with me husband? The one that is, <laughs> sorry, the one that's a, a reporter. <laughs> I'm just watching you react to the accent, and it's really making me laugh. Um, and <laughs> anyway, he's like. What leprechaun is going on? It's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, you know, God willing, and uh, and he's he's like, listen, you little leprechaun, don't tip the executioner. He can burst with rage like a big condom, a black condom, if you will. And she's like, listen, about that interview, what do you think? And he's like, I'll do it. I'll help you catch him, Sarah. I'll have you catch him, Sarah. A bit but, famous. <laughs> but I'm going to need something from you. I'm going to need a lock of your hair. It's just fucking dumb. Right. And she immediately is like, I'm sorry I asked. And click. You know, <laughs> she she hangs up on him like a poltergeist called her. Because that would be as well. Because you know what I'd be thinking? He's going to wank over that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's why you give it to him. <laughs> That's literally what he's asking it for. Yeah. I don't want him sniffing the lock of my hair and jerking it out over the fucking his bunk. I don't yeah. want that. You and I are different people. I've given my hair to no less than 37 prisoners. <laughs> you need to stop doing that and save what? your hair, Bo. <laughs> what? Oh. There's, a reason, that, there's oh. a reason I've got a Man, luscious I... head of hair right now, Bo. You don't. Here we go. Finally, it comes out, you fucking <laughs> Harris and bastard. Say, and saying that, though, uh, I mean, each to their own. If you're happy knowing that there are people getting pleasure over sniffing that hair, then, boy, that is all that matters. Hey, the lack of a hairline is why I do it, Duncan. It gives my hair immortality. <laughs> what am I going to do? C cut it and throw it away? Oh, yeah. Huh? The, the modern, modern day Larry Flynn. <laughs> I'm, I believe yeah, in no, using the whole pleasure. buffalo, Duncan. You like. <laughs> oh, buffalo. <laughs> the tusk. Everything. Oh. So, oh. <laughs> anyway, after she gets creeped out and hangs up, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll also, the, the funny thing here is I think she in this episode, uh, Katie McGrath is the actress's name. Uh, giving up all pretense of even trying to do like a flat accent. Oh it's, yeah, she's like, she's too far gone now. It's all over the place in this episode. Yeah, yeah it's, it's it's really 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 entertaining to watch. Yeah, like really because we don't know what character's showing up in the next she, scene. Yeah. She is just on a bronco of an accent, and it is <laughs> it is like eight seconds at a time. That's how she's living her life. And so, a, a, a white bronco of an accident traveling at 30 miles an hour being chased by a lot of police trying to pull her over for crimes against fucking cinema. That's um, right. So, we, speaking of, she and Robin, 
who you may remember as the dude that was married to Justin, mm -hmm. who died from rat poison, mm -hmm. are meeting for lunch. It, uh, like a, a liquid lunch, I'll point out. They're doing a little bit of drinking here. Well, yeah, he's he's two million in the hole. <laughs> so, Why you know, not? You know what will you know pull you out of that hole? Booze. <laughs> right. Like, I, yeah, he's just like, I'm never going to be sober again. <laughs> what? How much money do I owe? I don't care. I, uh, you owe a billion dollars. I don't know. We all owe a billion dollars. <laughs> what I love about this is they're meeting together because she doesn't like the sheriff. So what they're going to become is a pair of amateur sheriffs. Right. They're, they're like kid detectives here. And right. They're just doing nothing but spitballing over like, you know, let's figure out who this executioner really is. I mean, it can't be difficult to figure out who a killer is, Bo. Right. How long do you think it takes to detect? But what, I, but what I love about this is they're doing it in such the, the kind of, uh, this is a liquid lunch conversation because they're doing the whole like, uh, well, what about Dylan? No, Dylan wasn't here. Right that. Oh, behave, he's your husband. Oh, but maybe. <laughs> like, maybe. <laughs> maybe. It's uh, just, they go through like a ton of names. There's loads of potential suspects. They whittle them down and then Dylan's maybe in the mix. Maybe. Reverend Allen, Reverend Henry, rather, is, that... is the one that becomes the, the big suspect because our, our previous year killer let him live. That's right. So the the idea, and also he has been meeting, we learn, with uh, the local serial killer, Tom Winston. Yeah. Also, well. he looks like a, like a Bond villain. because he's got Right, a he's got a blowfield <laughs> kind of, you know. <laughs> no, I expect you to die. Parishioners. I expect you to pray. <laughs> right. <laughs> what do you, what do you expect us to do in this church, Reverend Henry? <laughs> I expect you to pray, Mister Bond. Um, you sick bastard! <laughs> what? I'm an atheist. <laughs> there are no atheists in foxholes. What does that have to do with anything? I got a license to pray. And you know Jesus coming straight for your heart. He's got a license to pray. So Meeting you <laughs> with a view to a prayer. <laughs> a view to a pew. <laughs> a view to a pew is where it is. Well done, sir. <laughs> Moving on. So Chief Brimley uh, is interviewing Trent. <laughs> So, <laughs> dance into the pulpit. <laughs> Enough. So, <laughs> we're National we Roy Albo. <laughs> <laughs> it's too far. It's gone too far. So, so Trent's oh. girlfriend June, or not girlfriend, oh. uh, uh. Uh, fuck! I got like, another like, ten. By the way, all I can think of is c c communion of solace. <laughs> <laughs> it's a better movie. Uh, <laughs> it, that movie is just spotlight. <laughs> They've already made that one. Um, it's, just, it's, just, it's just James Bond breaking the church scandal of pedophilia. <laughs> Right. Watch it. When are we going to run the story, Money Penny? What, while we sit on this story, kids are kids are being abused. It ends up in a dramatic scene on a helicopter above the Vatican. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have more altar boys, Bond. <laughs> it's the Pope's played by Christopher Walken. Yeah. <laughs> James Bond, you can't stop me. I, oh. I love boys. Oh, man. Oh, I love hunky God. boys. <laughs> those, and it's the, those cardinals have got those weird hats and they're like odd job throwing them. Yeah. Like, like fucking boomerangs. <laughs> oh, someone make that movie. Please, please make that movie. Uh, yeah, so anyway, sorry, before so, I derailed us with the Bond chat. No, so, because I was confused anyway, it's best that you did, 
Because intro June, who is a character I don't even remember seeing before, but apparently Didn't she's been in one clip before. May, I, I think I, she was, was at the was party, that, maybe. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah. So she is Cam's wife. Right. Cam potential the killer. killer. Yes. Yeah, the, well, not even potential. Cam the killer. Right. The killer's wife. Um and, and so he, she appears. Right. She is being uh questioned by Chief Brimley. And she's like, you know, no, no, Trent was a stand-up guy. He was a really good, nice guy. <laughs> and and well, like, now we get the backstory of Trent, who was an upstanding member of the community. He was he was a paramedic, worked alongside right. June. Um, and you know, you like he left under questionable circumstances, but then was very active. Kept, you know, like all all, all this stuff like that because he is he's been given sloth's death which is death by pit of vipers, right? Yeah. So, and we've, we've heard earlier on that Trent ain't no slouch. He, everything he did, you know, he gave a lot of energy to. Yeah. So there must be something in his background that we're going to have to dig up. Yeah, which right. Is why and, is here. and she's like, I can't think of a single thing. I think he was a pretty good guy. And Ka the whole time Cam is like watching through the window, like the fuck is going on in there? And she comes out of this questioning, like she doesn't say anything really, other than he was a nice guy and he worked as yeah. an EMT and that kind of thing. And then Cam is like, hey, why don't you uh, head on home? I'm going to see you there in a little bit. And she just kind of hangs out a little bit, a little suspiciously. Yeah, because she's, she's like making small talk. It's a lovely day, isn't it? It's very sunny, isn't it? <laughs> I'm like, this is a little bit suspicious. Right. Uh, but we're going to be seeing a lot more of June in this episode because... What, what, as soon as I saw him in more than three scenes, I was like, "That June's dying in this episode." Right. Before they could even get to it, I was like, "All right, we're going to get something about her past." Um, so we we move back to Robin and Sarah, who are now well into their drinking lunch, uh, which has become a drink. They've got dinner. the case solved. They found out who the third gunman was on the grassy knoll. It's, they found out nine eleven was an inside job after all. Bo, obviously. they drink until it's dark out, Duncan. Yeah, now, like that's how you know they're good and sauced by this point <laughs> yeah I, I missed that oh man and so they're just like it's totally him it's totally <laughs> the reverend <laughs> and and then june shows up and she's even drunker than they are and june is just like i'll give a shit give me some more margaritas <laughs> and they're like oh boy she's drunker than old saint pete we gotta <laughs> take her out of here and Which so Jin, like I was wondering how many slasher kind of, how many like nods and tropes we can fit into this horrible TV show, and we get skinny dipping because yeah. June strips off. I mean, she strips off, and then she goes in there and she's trying to get Robin in because uh, she's seen his penis a while ago, which is justification for getting him in. And um, we like to, to to cut this scene down very quickly because. It's there for no purpose at all. It with to give you the, you know, the the nods that June's maybe knowing more than she's letting on. Um, they phone the police. Cam shows up to get her. Cam is embarrassed, obviously. Um, and when <laughs> when Sarah's having the conversation with with uh, Cam, June starts buttoning up and she's like, "Ah, you've always had eyes for my man." And I'm like, "We've literally only seen you in one episode, so how you would yeah. know that?" I don't know. And it was for two seconds. And I don't think Sarah was in that clip either. And she's like, listen, I'm married. And she's like, your mother is a whore. Your mother sucks cocks in hell. Um, and I was like, oh, fucking hell. <laughs> so, it, right. So. It, like immediately Sarah's just like, I'm calling your husband and yeah. drops a dime on her. Does, does straight it, away. But yeah, that's it. I mean, come on. Yeah. And Maybe so well. it, while this is going on, while, while the, we're having the skinny dipping adventure with like robin and sarah and june at the park or mm -hmm. whatever lisa and fellows has shown up in town and is having dinner with allison oh. and dylan and this is where we really get the true measure of dylan yes yes and because uh lisa and fellows is like i'm lisa and fellows uh, that's... <laughs> you know me from when i was first mentioned five minutes ago right <laughs> I'm I'm the famous big city lawyer, and uh, and Dylan is like, oh shucks, you know I'm just a small town guy. This community's really uh, struggling. I'm just trying to capture their pain. And she's like, listen, uh, if if you're gonna be in the big leagues, you got to kind of cut the bullshit a little bit. Yeah. 
And she says, if you're going to take this, <laughs> this tactic, I will chew you up and spit you out like bad sushi. Bad sushi bull. Uh-huh. <laughs> and Dylan then is like, all right, well, look, here's what I care about. There's a guy who's really terrorizing this community. He is playing judge, jury, and hangman, because you can't say executioner, because that's his name. That's his name. It's a weird construction, but then he's like, (laughs) but but what I do is necessary. I'm keeping this community informed, and we are trying to stay together, and I will do it until uh, we have him caught, and he is behind bars. You mean something like that? Yeah, and I was like, oh. Right, right. Like, like, oh, hey. I didn't realize there was going to be so many snakes in this episode, Bo. Oh yeah, he's a he's a low down dirty snake. That's his 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 genus and species. Yeah, <laughs> and and then uh, turns out that Taiwanese snake isn't the most deadly of all. It's the backstabbing husband snake. Right up there with uh, I'm I'm lucky because I don't have to give a shit about what you think about me in terms of just like cool ass moves by characters in this episode yeah. one of mine uh in this one is when uh big city reporter lisa and fellows yep the bill comes and she and just she looks, just at, looks it. at it <laughs> yeah it's like uh somebody gonna get that because i'm i'm the guest if i'm not mistaken it's, it's, it's the it's the it's the thing from <laughs> it's the, it's the bit from a uh, jurassic park don't go cheap on me dabson <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> It's oh man, it's so good. And so Allison is like, uh, I guess I'll get the bill then. And Lisa she's like, Bellis no, I can is, get. It. And she's like, no, no, you're my guest. And she's yeah. like, that's right, get the check, bitch. Right. It's the hey, she's already reaching for it, and then you make the offer. Yeah. Uh, it's oh, I, I like the move. Oh, and, it's good. <laughs> and so she goes to pay the bill, which is weird because if it's that nice a restaurant, they, they just come, come over. Get it. Yeah, you don't you don't walk over to the. But she's also there. We're going to drop you off at your bed and breakfast, and everything's yeah. going to be okay. But now there's some discussion outside. Apparently, it takes a while to pay this bill, by the way, because there's a lot of dialogue yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, and Dylan is like, uh, hey, you know, we need to talk more about, you know, the future. Uh, because big city reporter Lee Sanfellows is like, look, there's going to be another big story that's going to come along and bury this one. You've yeah. got to be looking to the future and thinking what your next step is. And he's like, yeah, I guess that'd be a conversation I have with Allison. And she's like, fuck Allison. I'm having that conversation with you because I'm yeah. big city reporter Lee Sanfellows. Yeah. And, and yeah, he's just like, all right. Which um, once again, makes sense. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, wh- why deal with the owner of the paper when it's the reporter that you want? Yeah, like, what is the owner of this paper going to do? Like, uh, the story is going to be somewhere else, not, hey, we're waiting for the next big story in Waterbury. Yeah, it's fucking stupid. So, like, I, 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 he he's acting in such a way which doesn't make sense either because he's obviously clawed his way to that. And we find that he's a bit of a snake. That of course, they're having that discussion regardless. He's not He's not mentioning her. Ugh. Yeah. Ugh. Uh, right and, so, and just <laughs> just to put a button on on the shit with june cam does show up and it was what you were talking about earlier yeah. where she's just like you want to fuck my husband <laughs> and your mother's a whore right and and gets hauled back back off by cam yeah. but the next morning though this is where like dylan is like hey sarah i'm gonna be on tv and she's like you're what yeah on television <laughs> This is a like a, a once again a strange conversation where she she's like that. You, I, I just don't like I, you're a reporter. I just don't see why you want to be on television. He's like, well, I'm still doing reporting. It's just in, in front in front of cameras. And then yeah. she's talking about wearing makeup. And he's like, well, yeah. And he's like, and then he basically says, you don't have to watch it if you don't want. And I'm like, there's a supportive, loving relationship right there. Right. Like, why would you not like if you were a reporter, Duncan? Well, yes. this is a bad example because if you were like, "Hey, I've achieved a measure of success," I'd be like, "Damn you!" Um, but <laughs> but other it people, see me fail, Bo. you'd watch it to see me fail, <laughs> right? I... You'll fuck it up. He's gonna do it. I'll just watch time time will out on this one. Let's uh, let's watch this self destruct. Yeah, <laughs> the um... house always wins, Bo. The house always wins. <laughs> but but yeah, you would expect her to be like, "What? That's great!" Yeah. But instead, she's like, "What do you mean the television?" You know that's the devil's box, and <laughs> honey, that was like, your grandmother 
coming yeah. out. <laughs> so, but he, like, basically, she goes like she tries to change the subject by offering coffee. He's not interested. She tries to offer breakfast. That is not interested. And then he steals that lock of hair mm-hmm. from our well, steals it from a used brush, uh, which uh, yeah. Uh, even skeevier now, uh, and then puts it in a ziplock bag as if he's collecting evidence. All like as soon as he does this, I'm like that. Right, we're finally getting to the paternity test. Thank fuck. So we can remove that as a Duncan and Bone know exactly what's happening in this show and why we're just not getting it over with. Yeah. Um. So he's going to take he's going to take this away, and this is what he's going to use in the interview. Uh. But he's once again just adding to this. Dylan is not a good character. He's not a nice guy. No, no, he's kind of an asshole, and also, as we'll learn later, like, a little shifty when it comes to what he, like, just being honest with his wife. Yeah, and but the, I've got problems with this, and we're going to get to that, uh, but we right. will get to that pretty fucking quick. Um, so, so, there's yeah, so, Sarah yeah. creeping on Reverend Henry on the internet, just, like, looking up his church yeah. and stuff. And yep. this is where June shows up kind of unexpectedly. And she's because like, we have to get June in lots of scenes here because she's going to be our, our, our victim. So, right. <laughs> remember and, June? Remember June, Bo? And she's like, look, I am so sorry. I, I, I yelled at you about wanting to fuck my husband. And Sarah's like, oh, it's, it's fine. Listen, you and Trent, did you ever, you know, do the devil's business? <laughs> and she's like, what? No. No. That's crazy. But what in the classic <laughs> form of yeah, or the classic form of this show, we're gonna tell you one thing and undermine it three seconds later. <laughs> right. I um, could never possibly cheat my husband. I totally cheated on my husband. Yeah, just immediately started crying. Like all of these people would never stand a second of interrogation. Oh god, no. So we find out though that like we find out that basically she had had an affair with him in the past. Cam was aware of it. Um Trent left. Uh, working as a paramedic to take the strain off her as they went through counselling. They've come to the other side, but June is bestraught with grief because she feels she cannot grieve in any sizable fashion for someone that she did care for because Cam will think that it continued on. Which there is a weird kind of, I mean, it makes sense to an extent, but we need to, like, (laughs) Sarah's hearing all this and all Sarah's interested in was, what was the sin that he did? And yeah. this is the biggest load of shit I have heard this show do. It's... Yeah, this is the most tenuous. Is this a sin? Right, I mean... Is it? You know what I mean? <laughs> but... I don't understand what the issue... Is. Well, I do, but it... at the same time, I don't understand what this... This is not a crime that happens. He's not done something criminal. Yeah, it is vaguely unethical, maybe. Yeah, but, if anything, if anything, you could. I, I mean, a slight lapse in judgment, but nothing that would border on the criminal. In fact, the criminal element of it is the bit that makes the least amount of sense because it once again isn't criminal; it's negligent. Um, and if anything, it doesn't really amount to anything in the context. It wouldn't have done anything. So we transition to June giving her confession, right? And the confession is Bo. So what happened was the Heather's daughter, remember crazy Heather from... uh, We're now finding why she's crazy. Yeah. I'm glad we're swinging into that. So her daughter, Ariel, uh, went missing. Yes. She was 15 years old. She went missing five years ago, I think is what you say. I, I believe that's right. And the whole deal was that one night... Trent and uh, uh, what's June. Her, June were in this ambulance heading home. He was dropping her off, yeah. Uh, and they come across Ariel. Well, she like he comes across because June says that she'd already been dropped off, and this is through Trent. That's Trent right. Reveals the story that he's driving past, he sees her drunk. She's just thrown right. up. Stops. Asks her if she's okay. She says she's okay. Right. Right. And and so, and the the big sin is hey, he was coming off an 18-hour shift. Yep. If if he stopped and like took her to the hospital just to get rehydrated and that kind of thing, it would add another 2 hours to his shift 
it is common practice. If you run across a drunk teenager, you make sure they're okay, and then you kind of look the other way, which is what he did, and he leaves. Which is exactly what he did. So he left yeah. her, still, yeah, she was drunk, uh, but she was still standing, and she said she could make her way home. So he left her at that point. That's right. the sin, right? Or is the sin that she went missing, right? That was the last time anyone ever saw her, and he didn't report that he had saw her for the last time, even if he yeah. did the police are not going to do anything. Well, the but, police are okay. going to say, well, this is the last place that she was seen. Like, he's not going to lose his fucking job over it. He's not going to lose respect in the town or anything like that. He's the last person that saw her. If anything, it gives the police a timeline of where she was. It just, it, it just, it's fucking stupid. It really, really is. And like, it would have been so much better if there was a hunting accident that Trent was involved with. Something where there's an actual tangible something to gravitate on but you know a minor lapse in judgment where he doesn't take her to the hospital and she goes missing afterwards to me does not denote like that the, like, well he deserves to die in a pit of snakes <laughs> yeah yeah it's it, and, and the the excuse for why he didn't is kind of flimsy too which is just like oh the, he never would have been uh, uh forgiven by the town it's so you know? stupid right so it, 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 all, it borders on the dumb, like on the severely dumb. Yeah. And of course, Cam's here. Uh, and he is not taking any of this well. He is raging. He's like that. You know, all that time we spent, you couldn't come forward. You've been holding this secret and all the rest. But what I love about this is that they have, everyone has archived CCTV, CCTV footage from five years ago. Like everyone. Yes, 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 yes. Readily like available, boy, and easy to pull up. <laughs> Yeah, they immediately, um, well, no, first we have Dylan going to Tom Winston, Ugh. who uh, he hands over the bag of hair to him, and, yeah. right, it's just like, here you go, and uh, Tom Winston is like, how much does Sarah know, Dylan? Well, the first thing is, that baggy here ain't going anywhere with him. They're taking it off him before he gets back to his cell because that's how that works in prison. Not in the local penitentiaries. Yeah. Like, he, like, as as we pointed out, he lets himself in and out of this place like Otis the drunk. Yeah, he's, 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 he's you know, king of the hell here. Um, but yeah, like he asks him how much she knows and then provides a series of letters which he says you know I, I don't read everything that's sent to me but you know i'm fully aware of everything that gets sent to me and he's got this pile of letters that have been written to him from dylan yeah. who used his real name which is a stupid thing to do dylan um but also this is the first time this is coming up right how old are these letters because some of them look like he wrote them when he was a kid maybe or something yeah, but, yeah it's something it looks and... like there's a, there's a which makes you then question the entire relationship he's got with sarah but yes. then i also think if he's a caring dad that he's supposed to be, why did he not mention this to her earlier on? <laughs> well, but he he does that, like, how much does Sarah know about you, yeah. Dylan? And Dylan's like, oh, I thought I was here to interview you. Yeah. And he's like, quid pro quo, Dylan. <laughs> I have all these letters, so you start answering some questions. And I'll oh, start so answering yours. Fuck it. And we pull away from there, so we don't get a reveal to this at all. So big no. revelation, but no substance at all, because the show doesn't give a fuck about that. Um, let's let's pivot that away right. super fast, and let's go back to more mind-numbing banal shit. Well, now they're look at the surveillance footage that shows this girl, Ariel, from five years her ago legs. on Sheridan Avenue. Yeah, and their legs. <laughs> right, you see her feet, and you see the ambulance go by. Mm -hmm. and then you see another car like it takes off and they're like oh okay so what it, what she said about trent 100 percent true yep and so ariel was fine when he left and then another car pulls up and cam is like i just couldn't get the plates sorry about that uh their chief and he's yep. like you've got the make and model of the car it's not that big a town like who had this car five years ago mm -hmm. and but it's just this whole like i don't know how this, we're this gonna this guy's just <laughs> He, he's stymieing us left and right everywhere we look there, Chief. So, like, but this, once again, this, the details of this footage instantly become available to Sarah and, like, they don't see it, but Sarah and the press. Yeah, yeah. And so, it, all right, 
so then we we uh because tom winston is just meeting and greeting everybody in town reverend yep. henry is back there and reverend henry is just like uh just you know i thought i was I, I was leading trent and 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 uh on the path of righteousness and that kind of thing and tom winston is like you're too sentimental yeah yeah you're a wimp huh you're like a a little lady reverend <laughs> and he's like look god's work is being done you stupid reverend now give me your bible and so he hands it over and and then uh, we get a load of shite right like all this stuff is it's so obsessed with like all the episodes sound like they're biblical verses as well they probably are because we're so fucking clever sure um but he slips him the care and after giving them a you know a, a teaching of the lord about you know you know you know, sin and emotions and revenge and all the rest says he needs them to do one favor for him which once again why is this why is the priest indebted to the serial killer who, you know even if it gave me his calling or i he, guess because he didn't kill him back in the maybe day. it seems fucking tenuous um but you know so now we're, we, we are, we're left with the reverend has this here and he can now go off and do the paternity test which we once again the show is still trying to be like what could they want this here for i mean come on oh it's so dumb oh right and like i can't wait to get out of this room which we do yeah but it doesn't get any better but (laughs) no so then we go to crazy heather who has stopped traffic in town because she's yelling about trent mcbride who yeah you know as we know is now dead but is bemoaning, you know, what a terrible person he was. Yep. And then out comes June, because it's like, oh, right, the girl that's going to get killed in this episode. It uh, is June, yeah. but And she comforts her. If I could swap places with your daughter, I would do it in a second. I'm and, so and, sorry. And, uh, of course, but she's, she's like, <laughs> the greatest thing about Heather is, like, she literally, <laughs> she points at, um, is it Justin? They did? Robin. 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 Yeah. Point, and, like, basically talks about it. <laughs> fucking rat of a husband <laughs> points at Sarah, your fucking <laughs> black hole of a <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she fucking she does a real you know after a few drinks you know what your problem is you know what your problem is right. like out in the middle of, like so everyone can see it but she's being comforted and we're like mm, June's that what? sober friend that runs interference of like yeah. let me uh, I'll tell you what I know you want to dance it's time for but, you to but, sit down for a little <laughs> bit but June's like too involved here. Like you know, oh, what I mean about swapping places and all the rest, and we're like, we're like, what? There's something, something must be going on. And Bo, this show will not take long to tell us what that something is, because we are then, uh, we're in the paper next, aren't we? This yeah, the, it, yeah, because they're looking at that closed circuit footage of like a different angle. Yeah, yeah no, they're looking at it from outside the newspaper. The, the newspaper. Yeah. So she's retained. The woman that owns the newspaper has retained all the CCTV CCTV footage. For five years? Right. And for some stupid reason, we learned that June, who has revealed to everyone that this yep. ambulance drove by Ariel and she was fine. Yeah. It turns out, holy shit, she was in the ambulance too. She was in the ambulance. So what she was having, she was an adult or, or, or I, I don't know what this is insinuating or leading right. to out with that. She was in, she was in the vehicle as well. They were maybe going away for some sex. I don't know. I, I don't, don't know. Yeah, right. I don't know why June lies about being in the ambulance because everybody that knew about her fucking knows like that's common knowledge, whether or not yeah. you were, Hey, yeah, I happen to be in the ambulance. We were coming back from work it was well past the point where we had ended the affair we were having. Yeah. It was just late. And we happened to be in the ambulance. That's all. Yeah, it's a, it's, That's it's a needless it. lie. It's a needless right. lie. But basically we're now going to take this to, I love that we could take this to the, <laughs> the sheriff and the sheriff's like, Oh, I'll be a goddamn. Uh, so June will be the next victim. And uh, yeah, you can't, 
run with this story. You can't give any of these details out. And the the, the reporter woman is just like that. Ah, well, that's not right. And give me back my tablet because it's fucking mine. This footage yeah. is mine, which I brought to you, by the way. And he's like, well, this is evidence. He's like, yeah, I it's my evidence. So like, <laughs> fucking give right, me Right, but back. that's also kind of not how it works. Like at a no, certain, of course it's, not. <laughs> it, like it's against the law to withhold evidence. That's... Yeah, as soon as the, as soon as the police say it's evidence, guess what? It's not yours anymore yeah. until the case is concluded, or they have deemed it no longer admissible as evidence that's why i so, can't get my cocaine car back duncan so, they were like this is evidence in a trial and i was like yeah but that's where all my cocaine is so the sheriff's like you you're know like, you're not your helping fugitives, <laughs> your fugitive's name is june i want you to search every in-house outhouse dog house barn house farm house we're gonna do a hard target search of june's <laughs> so that we get all this and while all this is going out cam appears because remember cam um and Cam's like, well, what's going on? And he's like, well, <laughs> June might be the next victim, but I don't want you to get emotionally involved. Right, you're, you're too close. That line actually is said, you're too close to this, Cam. <laughs> because she's your wife, remember? I know we've not seen her much in the previous episodes, but she's your wife. Um, Dude, let me so ask he you, goes up- <laughs> real quick, I have to ask you if you noticed this as well, because it was so distracting to me, but in this scene, there is a fly climbing <laughs> on the chief's arm. And it's like, why did we not do a second take here? The, all I can see is this Mike Pence-esque fly yep. crawling yep. over the chief while we're having this big the, emotional the, scene about, like, I, I need your keys, Cam. I don't know if you know this about flies, but they are attracted to bullshit, which is what this sheriff is spouting and the dialogue in this scene. Yeah, um, it's yeah, one, it's, it's, one take slasher. That's what we got on our hands. And literally, that's how it feels, but he's going to go away with Sarah. Sarah's going to, you know keep him entertained at the gallery which by the way doesn't fucking work and meanwhile yeah. like, this is like we we, we do a transition to three things here which i think are pointless and at the same time vaguely annoying right and the three scenes <laughs> like, pointless the, the and three, annoying yes yeah, please the three the three scenes are one cam being tried to be consoled by sarah and that's like literally that last what three seconds. He, he didn't. Why he went with her to the gallery to decide he was going to go out doesn't make any sense. Um, because you don't just change your mind on that one. The second is Dylan returning back to the newsroom and being all pissy about the fact that he's been away doing this thing. And you know, like there's tensions there because I think the the owner of the paper is now like, well, listen, you remember you worked for me. And, you know, I took a risk on you and you're just going to disappear and play hooky all day. And he's like, well, listen, I'm your star reporter and I'm away doing it. Which, once again, is a fucking stupid scene because it adds nothing of value to anything out here. Except he's been away a long time between visiting the serial killer and going back to the paper. So I'm assuming we're going to get some time explained there because it could be in relation to because he might be the killer, not the killer, but he may be the killer, you know. Right. Um, he might be a, June, a red herring. June in the church, like, praying, and then, oh, I knew you were going to come for me, Mr. Executioner Man. He just walks into the church in full executioner gear, and then chloroforms her. These three scenes are troublesome on so many levels because, like, one, she knew the killer was going to come after her. She... Doesn't really, it doesn't seem like she is truly. I mean, the scene before, she's really sorry and she swapped places, right? I don't, I don't buy that. Um, even with a guilt, your husband's a cop, and if that's the case, you could lure the executioner in a way that he would get caught, thus stopping things. So, once again, June's an idiot. Um, Cam, like I say, it doesn't make sense for him, even remotely pretending to want to stay in the gallery. Let's just cut that scene out because it's stupid. Um, and then, like I say, the Dylan scene, which, if anything, just uh, creates tension between two characters that I couldn't give a fuck about at the moment. And I'm like, let's, let's just cut the shit and let's just get to the stuff that we are actually watching Slasher for, which is the death, which we... This episode, if we're talking about deaths at the hand of the executioner, is a death off scene with snakes and a death still to come. Right. It yes, it is the least executionary episode so far. It really, really is. And this yeah. is the halfway point. This is where you want me to ramp things up. This is where you want me to ramp up my interest. And they don't do it. And I, I find that 
this show started off, remember the first episode? A woman yeah. got her hands and feet cut off, a kid got bludgeoned to death, and we saw people murdered at the start. Um, <laughs> it was so bloody, so vicious, so violent. A guy falls down a pit and some snakes are flying him. Camera pans away. And yeah. then the end scene that we're about to get. It's just a lot of nonsense, but we do get a great scene. And the great scene is the sheriff out there doing the old uh, the old Jodie Foster in Silence of the Lambs, exploring the house. And I did love this scene. I thought this scene was great. Yeah, he, he thinks he sees a body. She's like, hey, hold on, goddammit. Hold on right there. And then, like, sneaks up on it, and it turns out it's just a a, a big dummy. Um, mannequin. Yeah, a mannequin. That's been Halloween through the chest into a wall. It is absolutely the scene of Halloween and, you know, uh, was it Greg? Uh, yes, yeah, Greg, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, who gets stabbed through the stomach like that. Like, he's like, well, can't I get your goddamn ghost, Greg? Huh? But for a second, I thought they were going to pull the switcheroo. Like, I actually thought they were going to go after the sheriff. Um, oh, just right, Just right. being set up. But like, that dropped within about three seconds of me going like that. Well, now, that makes even less sense because we've set up June as the... Although we'll get her... Pro, I would imagine we're going to get her full sin in the next episode because she's been abducted. And then the impracticality of what her character set up for her death is is mind-boggling it's like you really shite hannibal all right so it, there is one scene before that so let's yep. briefly touch on this and then we'll get to this ridiculous conclusion so uh before the ridiculous conclusion there's an equally ridiculous scene where sarah yeah. Uh, goes to Cam's place after learning, like, oh, June is missing. Like, yeah. you know, Brim, Chief Brimley is like, all the forensics, goddammit, there's a crime <laughs> scene here. I found a, a mannequin with a knife. Yeah. And so like, it's all hands on deck except for Cam, who is just sitting on his front porch looking dejected. Yeah. And Reverend Henry, his, his dad. He's there. Well, he's it's, there. it's his father. And it, she sees him and she's like, I just came by to see him. Is he okay? And he's like, no, he's not. Yeah. <laughs> what? His wife is missing and presumed abducted by a serial killer. No, yeah. he's not okay. And she's like, oh yeah, that makes some sense. And so she goes to chit chat with him and he, and he's just like, look, uh, you know, I just hate to say this on account of uh, me being a, a polite Canadian and all, but yeah. Sarah, you just carry uh, bad news with you wherever you go. And, <laughs> you know, it's one thing to say sorry, uh, but boy, it's just yeah. one thing after another with you. Um, Which hey, is what we've literally been saying since episode one. So I'm glad that everyone else has come into that conclusion. <laughs> yeah. And so he goes inside and just leaves her standing on the porch where she's just like, huh, boy, I sure wasn't in this episode too much, was I? Uh. And then we get our final moment, Duncan. Yes. Which is we, we cut to a field of gold. Yes. Uh, st sting style. Yep. And June wakes up naked in a field with yep. an IV bag attached to her, which I presume is keeping her paralyzed. A uh, 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 kind of semi sedate. Yeah kind of situation and we have very elaborate placed honeycombs covering her 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 naughty bits her boobs her and naughty her bits, yeah <laughs> yes or or yeah yeah covered with the <laughs> covered with some honeycomb and then a little rat appears at the side and uh we pull out uh, uh -huh. from the from the angle and um that's the end of that episode now i'm not a fee with my uh biblical yeah, and the punishment. So I don't know what that indicates, but like we already had rats earlier on, so I don't fucking know what's happening. It's um, uh, it's the old uh, speaking of Game of Thrones. It's you know the the warm bucket and the rats. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or you just put delicious honeycombs, and yeah. and the rats will eat her naughty bits. Yeah, they'll eat her to death. Yeah. Um, which will not be a quick process. Um. <laughs> 
I can tell that you would that. Be a bad but in way slasher terms, yeah. in slasher terms, the next episode will be five minutes later, and she will be a skeleton because uh, that's how time works in the slasher verse. Right. Not not eaten, just decayed. Yeah. yeah this like, is like this is this is my least favorite episode that I've watched thus far. I thought I got egregiously dumb. Yeah. Um, and, and there's just not enough goofy shit. Like Brenda's gone. Yeah. Um. The the other characters are kind of dull. Although the Chief Brimley stuff is pretty funny. Um. The Trent is pretty funny, but he is only in this for you know two minutes. Yeah. Um. So Duncan, we are being asked. Yes. Uh, what about next week? What What do you think the predictions? What What is what? Would the next episode of of Slasher hold? What is episode five? What is your prediction? Well, I, I think um, I think June will be dead. I don't think we're saving June. Uh, okay, which is uh, I, I'm going to just say it's going to be a hit to the show, a big, a, a colossal hit to the show. Um, I think what my prediction is another character that we know next to nothing about that we've barely seen will be next on the executioner's hit list with a ten years backstory. I think we'll get the real reason. Um, as to why June was taken, uh, but I think it'll be infinitely fucking dumb. Um, and I think we'll get a bit more information about what actually happened to Ariel, uh, which to me is now the more interesting part of the story. And I wish they'd just done a story about a kidnapping. Um, <laughs> for a quiet town, there seems to be a lot of tragedy here, Bo. Uh, that's my I, my prediction. My prediction is that my eyes will roll more than they did in this episode. So there you go. I'm going to say, I think the, I, I, all right. So I think we're going to learn that it was a paternity test mm -hmm. next episode. Yep. I think they're finally going to acknowledge what we've known for, you know, the entire series so far. Yep. Um, I think, yes, I, I agree. I think June gets saved and I think we lose either someone we've never met before or maybe Heather. Oh, Interesting. Um, potentially Chief Brimley, but I don't want to think about that. Yeah, I think he could still potentially be a a red a, herring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, but we'll get there, yeah. and you won't have too long to wait before we come back and and, and put episode five to bed. You right, right. So we will, uh, we will do this uh, sooner rather than later. Yeah. Before that time comes, Duncan. Mm -hmm. as we like to do in wrapping up the show uh first of all thanks to everyone who uh who watched and chatted and all that stuff it was uh i love doing these live it's a tremendous amount of fun mm -hmm. uh, so thank you very much for watching of course uh if you're just listening on on, on audio uh you can watch this for free we, you know follow us on the social media and you'll get uh, all that stuff um but uh enough thanks duncan where can people find you um, in the interim, please check me out on podcasts under the stairs, tputzcast, T-P-U-T-S-C-A-S-T dot com, and you get access to podcasts under the stairs. And all the other stuff I do, where, where to begin with, um, doing the nasty chronicle and opera omnia which is currently featuring Bo on this season as we work our way through fincher a brand new episode dropping this month where we look at a lesser known fincher film seven <laughs> yet to see it i heard good things <laughs> I'm really uh, looking forward to that episode, by the way. Yeah, it, that that's gonna go wrong. Go long, just yeah. Uh, almost said go wrong, which is true. <laughs> it will go wrong and long, uh, wrong and long. That is my tempo. Um, uh, on on my end of things, folks. Uh, obviously, if you're watching this, uh, you you have found Legion podcast. So, uh, you can also, uh, if you're not watching this, uh, find that at facebook.com forward slash Legion Podcasts. Uh, twitch.tv forward slash legion podcasts and youtube.com forward slash legion podcasts uh where you can see not only this show uh recording live uh but some other stuff we've got uh, the list of legends that is a a video only show um we will have a new one of those recording very very soon and if you're a member of patreon this very day uh, you'll be able to see another live video recording that is exclusive to Patreon members for a new show called uh, The Ouija Experiment Experiment, in which myself, uh, a horror scientist, um, enables a number of uh, guests 
uh, to come onto the show to determine the relative horror science success of uh, movies with the stupid Ouija title. (laughs) So that is happening, as well as other shows. We've got new shows. We've got the Scary Dad podcast on Legion podcast. So uh, be sure you're following all of that on uh, Apple and all that stuff. We've got about a 1,000 episodes available on the feed. That is not every episode we have that is available on the website. And uh, there's more stuff coming all the time. Almost almost daily. Not quite, but almost daily. Uh, you'll be able to find something new on Legion Podcast. So, um, Also, Duncan, I got to say, before we get out of here, this is a mm-hmm. little bit of brand synergy. Uh, at a, a, coming soon, Duncan and I will be merging <laughs> Twitch channel powers. Yes. In in a Wonder Twins esque manner. Uh as we play Man of Medan uh for the PlayStation, which is sort of a, a an adventure horror game in which we can play simultaneously and affect one another's game. Yeah. You and me and two of your friends simultaneous loving baby. Two or three. <laughs> uh we tested it out last night and I I think I can speak for both of us when I say I think we're both excited yeah about how this is going to go it's going to be very funny. There was a lot of it was a lot of us trying to sabotage each other very quickly in that. <laughs> yeah, Duncan wouldn't let me out of the goddamn room to start the game. Uh yeah, the the it's, potential fuckery is high and I'm yeah, looking forward. <laughs> it's it's very fun. So stay tuned for that as well. Uh nothing else to say but to uh order my my beloved co-host say good night duncan good night duncan ah thanks for watching everybody Too young, too scared I wasn't ready, I'm restless Longing